this uh, important discussion. Um, I'm very pleased to be with you. And we've got a uh, distinguished group uh, on the call and also lots of interesting uh, voices to hear. I've just rushed into my office, so forgive me while I just get everything organized. Uh, but welcome everybody and uh, let's, let's get underway. So I'm sure we've all had a chance to read through uh, the document and um, uh, we're going to have a series of presentations as you know and uh, let's get underway then. So welcome, we're on time and let's begin the process. So can I ask you to start the first presentation? Okay. Um, let me um, let me share my screen. Great, nice to meet you, Askar. Nice meeting you. Hi Ben. Hi Hi Nick. Uh, let me just make sure it comes through. And we've got your screen. And uh, okay. Um, well. Thank you, Professor Benedel, and, and, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking the indo Lumiti Scenario 2030 Steering Committee and the University of Pretoria GIPT for sponsoring the launch of this report. I also would like to thank all of you for uh, taking time to participate in this uh, program. I and uh, two colleagues from the Gauteng Department of Economic uh, Development started to, uh, to work on this project almost immediately after the, the first coronavirus patient was identified in early March last year. We finished an earlier version of the report uh, last July and began to present it to different forums and received valuable comments and suggestions. We're very pleased that the final report is being launched today with the support from, from all of you, the, the Indo Lumiti Scenario Steering Committee and, and Gibbs. And you all will receive the link to the final report uh, later on today. And it will be also on the ADRS's uh, uh, website. So, um, well, our starting point for this project uh, was that South Africa is experiencing two uh, major crisis. One is a, a health pandemic crisis uh, that has negative impact on the economy. And second is that as uh, the one we all familiar with, a chronic crisis of persistent low growth, high rates of poverty, unemployment, and, and inequality. So we asked two questions uh, and try to answer that through this, uh, we try to answer those to this report. First, what are the likely economic impact of the coronavirus pandemic? And secondly, what mix of policies are likely to mitigate the negative impact uh, of the pandemic and also to propel the economy on, a, uh, on an inclusive growth path? To answer these uh, questions, we, we use economic modeling uh, technique. We use a, a replicate of a South African economy. It's, uh, it's one of the models that we have built for on South Africa. It's a multi-sector uh, uh, macro, macro model. It captures the working of the South African economy using more than 12,500 equations that include more than 1,100 uh, regression equations that capture the laws of motion or behavior of the South African economy at national and provincial level. Um, using the, the time series data from the, the stats that says the Reserve Bank. Um, so it's a, it's a large model and, and, and it captures the interaction between the economy, the national economy, the nine provinces, oops, uh, the, the nine provinces, uh, and also the household's welfare, poverty, inequality, demand for social security, demand for the uh, taxations and, and others and feed into each other. As the economy evolves, it generates more jobs, better jobs, it distributes it among the unemployed in the household part of it. It, it, it reduces the demand for, for uh, uh, social grants and cost of it, feeds it back to, the, to the, the, the economy as a whole. It is linked to the exogenous shocks 
from the rest of the world, uh, and 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 in that sense, then it is a uh, it's a, it's trying to capture the working of the both the national provincial economy, the interaction between the macro and households, uh, and 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 we use this tool as a as a as a as a way of. Uh, doing what if scenarios, testing those two questions. This model uh, enables us to generate results at national level, macroeconomic results for key indicators, and, and also at the, at the provincial level, macroeconomic results, sector level results, both at national and provincial level for all nine provinces, and, and district and municipalities, macroeconomic indicators for the 52 districts and, and the 213 municipalities. And, and also, as I mentioned, household direct and indirect taxes, social security demand costs, uh, EPWP, poverty uh, level and poverty rate and, and inequality. So this is a pretty comprehensive model of the working of the economy and we use this tool to, to, to test the two questions that, uh, that we asked. Um, so to start, we said, well, let's start with the first questions in terms of bringing to answer those questions. We said, well, if there were no COVID-19, and the status quo policy remained unchanged. What would be the likely economic outlook for South Africa over the next decade? When we were in 2019, what was the outlook over the next 10 years with the policy status quo? We basically, that meant basically making assumptions about the working of the macro economy, assuming what would be the fiscal monetary policy stay as in the past uh, 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 during the 2010s, and also the uh, investment that the, the current expenditure government general expenditures goes up by 6% annually uh, the, in terms of investment and in terms of expended uh, uh, consumption expenditure by 7.5% annually. These are in nominal terms. Terms, and the public corporations investment goes up by 6%. Monetary policy remains strictly uh, inflation targeting. No new social policies are mainly being introduced. The uh, social security remains as, as, as before and, and, and adjust to inflation. So we run that scenario, no COVID with that scenario, and, 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 and generated uh, the, the model results. The key results at the macro level in terms of the, the GDP growth and, and, and employment, unemployment rate and poverty, what we found is that the economy basically, the, uh, the, the average annual growth rate over the next 10 years will be less than 2%, about 1.9%. Unemployment rate by 2030 would be 26.3%, uh, and more than one third of the population will be still uh, under the uh, poverty line. This is the uh, lower bond poverty line. So that meant basically you have the basic, the, the economy will basically follow the same past trickle down basically or is bourgeois scenario of indolumity with outcomes of low growth, high unemployment, high poverty and high inequality. So to this then we added the COVID. So we said, well, what if the, the policy status quo remain unchanged even with the COVID? So we introduced COVID no policy changes, and we want to see what would be the likely future uh, economic outlook. So to do that, we had to develop scenarios uh, uh, regarding the, uh, the COVID scenario. Uh, and here we built uh, the six scenarios relating to, to the COVID-19 uh, based on a combination of domestic and international shocks uh, to the economy. Uh, domestic shocks refer to measures adapted by government and public to bring under control COVID-19. Three possibilities for these domestic measures we, we, we considered low, moderate, and, and high. And then for the international shocks to South African economy, we consider two possibility, moderate and high shocks, high, uh, high level shocks. And the combination of the three domestic and two international possibilities provided us with six COVID-19 scenarios. And each of the scenarios postulates percentage of population that is likely to be infected, the extent of economic disruptions due to direct domestic reactions to it, and the extent of the global economic slowdown and its spillover effect. 
So then we translated these six scenarios because we wanted to use the model. We have to quantify these scenarios, and 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 we spend a good amount of time quantifying these these uh, uh, these uh, uh, COVID nineteen scenario. What does it actually mean, and what type of shocks? What is the magnitude of shocks as a result of each of uh, each of these scenarios? So there. We looked at in terms of the direct shocks, local shocks. We considered that the the, the shocks to the economy in terms of shutdowns, in terms of the um, uh, social distancing and and others. We we looked at four variables in the economy are being uh, directly impacted: household consumption expenditures, investment expenditure, production, and employment. And since the model is a sectoral, is a uh, is a bottom up type model, we 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 looked at we differentiated in terms of household consumption among uh, in terms of different types of consumption expenditure whether it's healthcare expenditure or it is a, a spending on autos or, or entertainment we took those into consideration to construct the magnitude of shocks for each of the scenarios or so same in terms of investment shocks uh, and production shocks we also looked at differentiated between essential sectors other sectors we have 45 economic sectors and again took those into consideration look at international literature and and south africans you know past uh, reaction to the crisis and 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 I specify those shocks and in terms of employment the same we looked at the sectoral shocks and 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 specified the shocks at the sector level so four variables we said is being impacted by domestic measures that are trying to basically bring in the control the the uh, the covid-19 in terms of the international spillover international shocks to the south african economy uh, we looked at six variables basically exports imports that the South African exports, import exchange rate, gold price, oil price, and foreign direct investments are impacted, that these, these variables are, are being affected by international pandemic that are affecting the South African economy. And again, we spend good amount of time defining it, uh, trying to, to specify the magnitude of shocks and uh, each of those six different scenarios of the uh, uh, COVID-19 and at the sector level. Having that, then then we can then we went to introduce run the model to answer the questions. What if the, the status quo policy remain unchanged and now we have the COVID-19? What would be the prospects for, for the uh, for the South African economy over the next 10 years? We'll run the model and, and with the six COVID scenarios. And the, the red trends are basically that business as usual scenario with no COVID. So where you see red scenario red trend that is that uh, no COVID uh, scenario gives you a, a baseline uh, basically scenarios to to see the comparison as you can see the, in terms of the gdp growth depending on the COVID 19 the severity of the COVID 19 uh, which are the six scenarios the the economy is being hit hard or less hard you know but in in all the three cases it's being hit the gdp or the unemployment rate uh, impacted or the poverty gets impacted so what we have is see is that therefore there is a uh, uh, depending on the covid the real gdp growth for the for 2020 is likely to drop between minus 4.4 and minus 12 percent unemployment rate we we found that is likely to increase to 35 to 40 percent in 2020 poverty rate is likely to increase by by between four and seven percentage points increasing number of poor by between two and a half and four and a half million and in terms of what happened after the 2020 after the initial shock uh, we find that, as you can see from what happens, the, the, the adjustments afterward, the economic transition will neither be quick nor uniform. It takes multiple years. Negative economic impact of the pandemic is expected to persist in the in the medium term. So you see that by 20, 2023, 2025, gradually it will gradually uh, get you know uh, unemployment rate or growth starts coming back. And, and very importantly, over time, what you find is that with business as usual policy scenario and, and COVID, uh, you find that economic indicators tend to gravitate toward the low growth, high unemployment and poverty trends established by policies and status quo. As you can see, the GDP starts recovering, but eventually by 2030, it starts gravitating toward that low growth path of the business as usual scenario that we had. Or the unemployment, it starts recovering, but it is also 
recover by 2030, it's coming back to that baseline scenario that we early on in the first scenario we run, and the same with the poverty and others. So then we, we uh, I'm, I'm here only showing you the, uh, at the beginning, the, the national level uh, results we have, we show, we go to other ones, the other uh, provincial and others at the end. Um, then, then, then we ask the next question. So, well, what if, given that uh, outcome, that the, 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 what if the COVID-19 changes the policy status quo? Uh, what policy mix is likely to mitigate the impact of the virus, reduce the impact that the virus has on the economy, and at the same time, propel the economy on an inclusive or uh, nail a walk uh, growth, uh, growth path? Now, to answer this, we run many, many hundreds of scenarios and, and, and at the end, put it together in the following six pillar policy bridge. We, we propose, we, we, we found a six pillar uh, uh, set of policies that a combination of them can, uh, can help answer that question. And I'm gonna take you through quickly those, those uh, uh, pillars. The first pillar is the macroeconomic policy reform. Uh, and, and, and there we, we looked at the immediate macroeconomic policies that need to be going into effect in terms of mitigating measures and after uh, for, from 2021 to 2030 uh, measures. Initially, we said there is a need for uh, uh, austerity, austerity proposal to be put aside because the COVID-19 demands expansion, not contraction of available resources to address the pandemic and its effects. Uh, government budget for transfer spending needs to increase because uh, as you will see the social, uh, the pillar two, which is about social policy, a number of policies need to, we, we propose in that uh, uh, pillar that needs to be funded in terms of transfer that the government needs to, uh, to be able to you know, fund those. And also in terms of the additional 50 we propose in this scenario, uh, 50 billion uh, additional government final consumption expenditure to, to support the needs of the healthcare system, education, and other central, provincial, and local governments during the COVID-19 to, to basically deal with the, with the crisis, the uh, uh, health crisis. There is a need for allocation of financial support to businesses, uh, mainly in the form of tax benefits and subsidies. There is a need, we suggest a, a, a 4% increase in government, uh, general government social infrastructure investment budget to support uh, COVID-19 related public health needs, uh, uh, infrastructure needs and preparation for reopening of the schools and businesses. And there's a need for reductions in interest rates and increase in low cost borrow, borrowing. This is in terms of the immediate uh, macroeconomic measures post uh, afterward from 2021 to 2000, uh, 2030 uh, we the, the scenario uh, considers an uh, increase of investment in economic infrastructure social infrastructure and economic services by 10 percent annually over the next uh, 10 years uh, this is in, in nominal terms that annually an average increases by by 10 percent uh, the the government uh, infrastructure uh, investment um, this is about 4% uh, above the current uh, uh, rate annual increase, but it is much less than what was in the, uh, during the 19, uh, 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 during the 2000s, uh, uh, where, uh, and, 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 and during the 2000s, especially during ASVISA, uh, the annual increase in public investment went up to even uh, above 30%. Um, then the second is, is a element of this scenario is, is that the government annual current expenditure needs to also increase by an additional 3% in order to provide more financial support for delivery of social services over the next 10 years. And uh, also the Reserve Bank needs to relook at its uh, monetary policy and adapt the dual mandate of using monetary policy tools to help achieve a growth target of 6% and price of stability. This is something that's called the nominal GDP uh, targeting with the target of the 8% for upper limit of the inflation rate. And that the uh, monetary authorities needs also uh, take necessary steps to increase, to raise the annual growth of credit extension to private sector uh, to 15%. Uh, it used to be in 2000s, uh, the average growth of annual growth of credit extension was 15 and a half percent. In the, uh, in the 2010s uh, period, it has dropped to less than, uh, to around 7%. Uh, 
uh, and, and we're proposing something that was happening before and needs to be uh, happening again. So that was the pillar one in terms of macroeconomic policy uh, uh, framework uh, uh, reform. And, and the second is about the social policy reforms. And here also we're looking at the mitigation, mitigating the COVID and also post COVID. In terms of the mitigating COVID, the government we suggest that needs to immediately introduce an unemployment grant for all who have become unemployed in 2020 and all the skilled unemployed. Uh, receiving a thousand rand a month. Uh, they also, there's a need for also increasing, this is immediate in terms of the uh, uh, immediate mitigation measures, begin to make uh, public works as the employer of last resort for unskilled unemployed. Uh, and uh, in 2020, we suggest that EPWP expand to cover about 35% of the unskilled unemployed uh, and paying 160 rand a day. Uh, and they also the, the, the Department of Social Development introduced a new uh, single caregiver grant per family uh, for the family member that takes care of child, uh, a child who receives either a child support grant or a care dependency grant and initial grant of 350 rand. And, and the child support grant also increases from 455 to 500. After 2020, over the next 10 years, then we say that the, the, the EPWP needs to gradually cover uh, all the uh, unskilled unemployed uh, gradually increased by uh, uh, the uh, 2021 also to 73 percent, and afterward, three percent by 2030, it becomes a uh, hundred percent uh, covering the unskilled unemployed. The caregiver grant also needs to be extended. Uh, the initial 500 monthly uh, grant needs to increase by six percent annually. The unemployment grant also, the adult unemployment grant also uh, needs to continue to help uh, those with the, the skilled unemployed to remain in the labor market and become active in the continue labor, active in the labor market. Uh, and, 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 and that the, all the grants also adjust annually to uh, 6%. So that gives us the combination in terms of the social uh, policy uh, component of the, uh, uh, of the six pillar. Um, in terms of the uh, the next uh, pillar of the uh, reform uh, suggestions uh, scenario is the macroeconomic policy reform. Here we basically adapted what the Treasury is document in 2019. That's the modeling that it does, uh, the scenarios that uh, it, it it proposes. We say, well, what if those those scenarios just basically we replicate those. What if those scenarios happen as as they have uh, put it forward in terms of uh, helping the output of the certain sector economy, targeting agriculture improvement uh, in the uh, uh, agricultural export, price competitiveness of some of the sectors, communications, transports, and others. These are all very specific quantitative uh, in the uh, in the report. Labor productivity of, of, of certain sectors, targeted sector increases, and also the competitiveness of, uh, uh, of the economy as a whole increases. We basically capture that and we say, what if that, uh, that uh, the, the macroeconomic reforms that are being proposed also, you know, uh, in, in, uh, that has been modeled is, 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 is replicated as, 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 as suggested. The next uh, uh, pillar captures the trade and industry reform. And, and, and here we reviewed the, the, the uh, trade and industry policy over the last 10 years, the IPAP and others, and said that there are a lot of measures that trade and industry is doing. And now we're talking about the master plans and other measures that are basically have four focus, investment, increase investment in manufacturing, increase total exports, reduce import dependency ratios and increase labor intensity of production. And we say, what if the measures that are adopted, the same way as the one the treasury, we looked at treasury, what if those will succeed and, and, and what would be the impact of it? What if the investment in manufacturing goes up by about 10 billion due to the measures 
that are the, the, the DTI is adapting increases by 10 billion annually over the next 10 years? What if there is an increase in total exports due to the SEZ program, Africa integration program, is that the exports increases by one and a half percent annually? What if the, the South Africa uh, uh, governments, probably South Africa and localization also reduces import dependency ratios by about 20 percent over the next 10 years? And, and also what if there's an increase increase in the labor intensity uh, of, of, of production, gradual increase there. So that's, that's, that is also part of the scenarios, the, the overall uh, uh, six pillar scenario therefore includes the industrial, uh, the trade and industry reforms. And finally, and, and I mean the fifth uh, pillar is the private sector international support pillar. And, and here we captured, we can say, what if through the public private growth initiative, the private sector increases investment in South African economy by 500 billion over the next 10 years. This is something that the, the PPGI has, has promised, has, has uh, came up with and we said, well, what if that happens as a new investment? What if also in addition, in order to contribute to broader socioeconomic development, the PIC, Public Investment Corporation, also increases its investment in South African economy by 100 billion uh, over the next uh, five years. And, and thirdly, what if after COVID-19, the level of foreign directed investment in South Africa gradually increases from uh, half a percent 0.05% uh, of the GDP to about 1.13% of the GDP between 2021 and 2030. And, and, and finally, what if the COVID-19, after COVID-19, the, the nominal value of the world trade, world import grows annually by 8%. Um, so here is, we, we captured what we thought, you know, some of the measures that are possibilities for the private sector, international, under this um, international, international support, uh, under the fifth pillar. And finally, the sixth pillar integrates bringing the provincial growth and development plans into this, uh, into the overall national uh, uh, scenario. And here we look at, ideally, this pillar should include input from all provinces, provinces, but we had, we work with the, the Gauteng and Gauteng has a medium term policy plan to 2030. It's called Growing Gauteng Together 2030 that includes more than 160 interventions to promote industrial development, provide social services, improve social and economic environment to do, do doing business. It's a pretty detailed uh, 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 plan. And we say, well, let's Look at what if the the GGT is is succeed in in achieving its uh, uh, its goals, and we translated that into a specific sector shocks to the provincial uh, side of the model, uh, the uh, based on the 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 GGT 2030. What if some of those industrial measures? What if some of those uh, African regional trade uh, measures that they have, and 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 also a strategic sector supports that they have succeeds whether in terms of increasing exports of this province, whether it is in increasing investments or any do, uh, 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 measures like in employment and others, what if those also uh, come uh, come true? And, and, and we captured that as part of the overall scenario. So here you have the, the six pillar uh, scenarios. This is doesn't didn't happen at once. This is a, you know, kind of first you start with the low hanging fruit and then it, it is not enough and you're building up and you need more and you need more, you're dealing with the growth or employment is not happening or the poverty is not happening. So you're briefing up your social uh, policy pillar, you're changing. So there's a lot of back and forth between these pillars. Now you are getting the final outcome of it, but it is not like it is uh, just the, um, you know, put together in, 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 in a, without a lot of back and forth and trying to do the least possible, but get the most uh, uh, that, it, that can be, uh, that, that deals not just with growth or deal with the uh, few variables, but both growth, employment, poverty, and inequality. So we run the model based on these six pillar scenarios. And, and, and the results uh, here, is, is basically now we landed with the mild scenario and severe scenario, COVID scenarios. And, and, and what we find that the six pillar policies are able to mitigate to some extent the impact of the coronavirus. You can see it on the severe scenario. The blue is, is the uh, business as usual uh, scenario and the green is basically the six 
pillar scenario. As you can see, the depth of the shocks, for example, to GDP reduces. It takes shorter amount of time for the economy to recover. And as it recovers, it continues under the sixth pillar, for example, the economy continued to grow rather than gravitating to that low growth path under the both scenario. Same thing with the unemployment, as you can see gradually, again, uh, instead of uh, it, it, it's a shorter period of recovery and the unemployment rate continued to go down under both scenarios. So it's, it's, we're finding that it reduces basically the shortens the recovery produce, produces average annual GDP growth of 6.2% create between 8.7 million and 10 million jobs over the next 10 years and reduces the unemployment rate by almost 70% to 12% uh, by 2030. In terms of poverty, it lowers the poverty rate also by almost 50% to 23%. You can see again here the green as, as, the, as the scenario, the, the six pillar scenario continue the poverty rate and, and the inequality also reduces the, by 16 percentage points. The Gini coefficient increases by 16 percentage points. Um, then in terms of the uh, other indicators that things that we didn't talk about, I've, uh, one of the features, one of the important features of this combination of supply and demand side measures, the combination is that we are producing a balanced growth as a result of this. And this is reflected in this graph where you can see that the, over the, with, the, with the six pillar scenario, the aggregate supply, which is basically the sum of the models uh, production, growth value added uh, at basic price of the sectors of the economy, and aggregate demand is total expenditure in the economy of government spending, household spending, ex imports, exports, and investments. And as you can see, the economy as it goes to 2030, as it grows, both it, it is growing basically in a balanced fashion, both demand and supply are growing. And that's very important in terms of the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the nature or the characteristics of this, uh, uh, the framework. The other issue is that we didn't talk about uh, each of the proposals that uh, I, I went over, did not go over the how much it costs each of these. So this is basically a give you a, the, mod, the, the document, uh, the report goes through those in detail in terms of fiscal and debt sustainability issue. Of, well, we proposed a number of things from macroeconomic side and social policy. How, did, how do we pay for this thing? How does it, you know, how does the economy uh, uh, able to uh, pay for this? And this is very important in the sense that if you're co comparing here, we're comparing six pillar policy with the business as usual scenario. The scale of these graphs are exactly the same. As you can see under the six pillar scenario, both the, the higher growth, the 6.2% average annual growth rate that we're getting over the next 10 years, obviously it increases government income and expenditure. So while the expenditure is going up to pay for the EPWP or social security or government is, is increasing 10 to 10% government investment in the economy or government current expenditure, the expenditure is going up, capturing all of those, but at the same time as the economy is going up, the blue bar shows that the revenue, government revenue is going up. The, under the base scenario, the economy is going slower, the revenue is lower, the expenditures are lower, there is, there, is a, there is a relationship between that expenditure and that, but it is at a lower growth uh, trajectory. This, the graphs here, the, the trends shows the revenue relative to GDP and, and expenditure relative to GDP. Uh, and basically the uh, deficit GDP ratio as a difference in that. As you can see, initially during the COVID shocks, obviously the deficit goes up, that the gap between these, the expenditure GDP ratio and, 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 and revenue is, is there is a gap there. But as you can see gradually over time, it actually that gap closes. And, 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 and it is actually under the base scenario with low growth path that the gap actually between the revenue and, deficit, uh, and expenditure GDP remain positive. Uh, and the same here with the, you know, uh, if you look at the other uh, uh, policy uh, scenario. Now the implication of it for the debt GDP ratio is what you see here, uh, is that uh, under the, uh, uh, the mild scenario and under the severe, severe scenario, you'll see that the, the baseline scenario under the, the business as usual scenario, you have the debt GDP ratio 
coming down, increasing at the beginning, but coming down gradually, but is still above the baseline scenario. And it is in the six pillar scenario with the, with the higher growth rate that, that is allowing the debt GDP ratio actually to continue to go down to, to around 40 so percent by 2030. And the same here under the severe scenario, the, the, there's more spending, there's more uh, resources need to go to mitigating the crisis. So the debt GDP ratio goes higher the, under the severe scenario, but eventually, as you can see, again, the, uh, the six pillar scenario that is more growth oriented is able to the denominator of the debt GDP ratio bring it uh, bring it down. Um, the model, as I mentioned, uh, is also produces results, consistent results, set of results with the, with the national level results are consistent with the national level results for all the nine provinces. This is example of the uh, the results for the for the Gauteng and KwaZulu Natal, and you can see for the mild scenario and severe scenario for growth. For, uh, for growth, for employment, uh, uh, unemployment rate, poverty rate, uh, poverty gap, and inequality, and comparing the 2020 with each of the, the scenario, base, uh, business as usual scenario and the COVID-19 scenario, for each of the provinces. The important thing is the consistently be, consistency between these and the results that you get uh, from the, at, the, at the national level. We also, the model also generates results for all the districts. This is example of, this is the 52 districts. This is, is uh, example, the economic growth uh, for the base scenario versus the six pillar scenario. This is the employment addition to the economy for the 52 districts, comparing base scenario with the business as usual scenario with the six pillar. And here is the poverty level, again, comparing the, the, the uh, for each of the districts. And, 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 and also the model also consistent with the, with the rest generates results for all the municipalities. Uh, again, here you have for each of the province, the municipalities under the Northwest or Gauteng or Western Cape. Here is about the poverty rate in Northwest comparing the business as usual 2020 with business as usual for 2030 and six pillar scenario. And, and here is about the unemployment rate and about the growth rate. Uh, so this is a uh, an important, you know, that we are we having a story. We're looking at the the COVID nineteen both at the national, provincial, and local level in a in a using a tool that gives us a consistent level uh, uh, set of results. So um, looking at this as a whole, we said we wanted to look at. Uh, we were asking the question: uh, Is there a way of uh, coming up with a set of policy? Uh, uh, basically roadmap that produce inclusive growth. And we think that the six pillar policy framework produces it, it, its impact on the poor, on the working class and business class gives us basically a, 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 a inclusive uh, growth. And, and, and because the poor basically the national poverty rate declines by almost 50% to 23% from 2020 to 2030. Poverty, the poverty level declines during the next decade by about 10 million. And there's a significant improvement in the delivery of social services in terms of education and, and, and housing and economic infrastructure. All that spending policies that we were talking about, the government infrastructure and spending, uh, particularly they've uh, improved the living condition, is expected to improve the living condition of poor families. Uh, in terms of the working class, uh, the uh, impacted by this scenario, the unemployment rate declines by almost 70% from 35% uh, and 40% and in severe scenario to 12% by 2030. The economy adds 8.7 to 10 million jobs to total employment between 2020 to 2030. The national income inequality uh, declines by 16 percentage points. And again, that significant improvement in the delivery of social services and economic infrastructure uh, improved the living condition of millions of working class families. We also think that the business class also stands to significantly benefit from this scenarios. For example, the real GDP is, is, uh, will almost double. In, uh, over the next uh, decade, which implies a significant expansion of domestic market for all the businesses producing goods and services. Average profit rate in the model remains above 16%. Improvements in the economy and overall well-being of the population improves 
average labor productivity, government debt GDP ratio will gradually decline due to high uh, average annual growth to less than 50%. Average investment GDP ratio, something that is really important, investment GDP ratio. This is the only scenario we have uh, that, uh, that increases to above 27%. The government, the, the ND, NDP has been talking about 28% investment GDP ratio, but none of the programs that have been put forward by, by, uh, by uh, government provides that, uh, that kind of outcome. And this six pillar policies is, is the outcome of simulation shows that investment GDP ratio increases to about 20%. And we think that there will be an increase in social cohesion given the benefit of the scenario that increase in the social cohesion, that nail a walk scenario that underlie the six pillar uh, scenario, uh, improve social cohesion, which enables a stable capital accumulation. Uh, now, in terms of limitation and expansions of the, the model, the, uh, the, the currently evolving uh, COVID-19 creates obviously much harder, much more uncertainty in terms of economic forecasting. And our working assumption is that the reality will fall somewhere within the range of the scenarios that we have considered. So we have mild and severe scenario results that the two extremes and, and we think that that's, you know, but there are also COVID scenarios that are not included in this study, but deserve consideration. For example, the possibility of the return of COVID-19 as a serious health threat in the future. Uh, the six pillar approach also does not specify, specifically focus on global warming. However, we have acknowledged the need for public investment in greening the economy by allocating part of the proposed annual increase in public investment for that purpose. Nevertheless, we think much more work must be carried out in this area. Thus, the public sector in South Africa has the necessary institutional capacity to successfully implement these proposed measures of the six below. That's, people ask that question. It sounds good, but can we do these things? Well, we think that the key departments and institutions upon which the successful ex uh, execution of this six pillar program relies. Treasury, Reserve Bank, Department of Social Development, Department of Trade and Industry, they already have extensive experience and proven success in implementing of similar measures. The improvement or the strengthening of the state's internal capacity does not obviate the existing capacity to carry out these reform measures that are within the capacity, capability of the relevant department and institutions identified in the, in the report. And finally, the application of the model to COVID-19 demonstrates not only its utility to design and conduct analysis of the pandemic, but also it can be possible, it's possible to, for, uh, we haven't done that utility for uh, planning and preparation of other uh, future disasters. Now, in terms of final remarks, the, uh, the, the results of the, the, this report shows that the future outlook associated with the business as usual scenario. If we stay with the business as usual scenario of the, which is now has moved even more to more conservative, become more conservative. But if we stayed in the, the, the past scenario, it will be trickle down economy, stuck in low growth, high rates of unemployment, poverty, inequality. What is that in the indo Lumiti is considered that this bourgeois scenario. If the current push to use combination of supply side economics, which is the treasury document 2019, and the austerity, which is the 2020 budget and maybe the 2021 budget succeeds. If this combination of supply side economics and the austerity succeed, then the future outlook can be even uh, worse. And, and that will basically mean the Guara Guara scenario of the indo Lumiti scenario. The results of the six pillar policy framework, more than anything else, I think most important is that it shows that there exists a policy roadmap. There exists a policy roadmap that effectively responds to both the COVID-19 uh, induced crisis and South Africa's chronic crisis uh, uh, to realize an inclusive uh, growth path or to put the economy on the nail or walk uh, scenario. The, 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 the model, the link national provincial model with its platform allows the public to design, test, verify its own similar or alternative inclusive growth scenarios. 
there is not only one scenario that is uh, in front of South Africa. There are multiple scenarios, and we indicate in there is a possibility. There are other, uh, it is possible to generate, you know, close to 10 million jobs or, uh, or, or, or over the next 10 years. We don't need to be satisfied with the 1 million or 2 million or 3 million over the next 10 years. There are possibilities uh, in there that, uh, that can be looked at. Moreover, as an integrated model of national, provincial, and local economies, we were able to not only bring together uh, national and provincial planning, but also produce likely future impact of policy scenarios on, on key indicators at national, provincial, district, and municipal levels in a consistent uh, manner. Well, thank you very much. I, I appreciate I, I hope I didn't take too much time. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Askar. Um, uh, so welcome those of you who've joined us in the last uh, few minutes. Uh, that was a very comprehensive and well-articulated uh, overview of what you've put forward. So firstly, let me say thank you for that. Um, there, there are many questions that are gonna flow from this discussion, I'm sure, and then some of them on the chats already. So please add your voices to that. Um, but firstly, let me say that I'm, I'm very struck by the social orientation of this uh, uh, policy mix, uh, because that is clearly what we need to address. I'm sure there'll be a fierce debate about its possibilities, about how coordination happens, and about how implementation happens, which you hinted at towards the back end. But we'll come to that. So um, thank you for that. And um, let me just go through the agenda quickly. Um, so Dr. Pali Lohotlo is now going to uh, contextualize the work ADRS has done and the Indula Miti is gonna tie them together for 15 minutes. Uh, I'm afraid we haven't had a response from uh, Deputy Minister Masonda's office. So we're still trying to check if he is going to join us. But then uh, Dr. Ntabiseng Moleko and uh, Isam Mklanga from Alexander Forbes will respond to these two presentations. And then we'll give Askar just a brief opportunity to comment on, on the panelists and their feedback. And then we'll open it up to a, a, an hour of uh, open-ended discussion. So that's the route ahead. So again, those of you who've just joined, uh, welcome and thank you for joining us. And I'm now gonna hand the floor to, uh, to Paid Lohotla. Yes. Uh, am I unmuted? You are unmuted and welcome. And we always and delight to hear you. And am I visible? Uh, yes, you're no, not thank visible, you very much. Uh, but you're hearable. And uh, my <laughs> screen is uh, available. Your screen is up. Your screen is up. But we can't see you. But we can see the slides. So, as you all oh, know, you see the yes. You all okay, know. I'm I, background and uh, I've met him a num and listened to him a number of times. I always find what he says to be very insightful. Uh, and the Statistician General, ex Statistician General. So welcome to you, Pali, and the good work that you always do. I look forward to it. Well, thank you very work. much. Uh, I'm given a task of contextualizing uh, the idea, uh, the Idula Mete scenarios. Uh, in the main, um, and just to give a short background, when I was in government, I was quite aware of the Ill, um, Ill, Ill, Ill capacity to handle scenarios. Um, scenarios are not new in South Africa. We had uh, scenarios in 2000 uh, that uh, painted a picture about uh, South Africa. And this were looking at uh, Skedong, which was uh, a, a, almost an equivalent of it, a, a flounder in dawn, Ludisana, which is um, be in peace with our poverty and social Oza, which was the desired uh, uh, role that South Africa would play. And uh, it was actually captured in how train as an image, a caption for that. These scenarios were discussed at every cabinet Lohotla uh, uh, under Begis administration, President Begis administration. And uh, as scenarios, we also explored what if we go into Skedonk. And the Skedong scenario is very interesting in that uh, it predicted to the date the events that would follow in South Africa. And of course, uh, 
now we know. The only thing that we didn't know as we are looking at the Skadonk was who would be the actors. There would be actors, but the names of the actors. So scenarios are very important. And when in 2015, we saw South Africa was in trouble, a group of people came together to establish Idlamete scenarios. I was roped in at the time while I was still in work at work. And at that point in time, I was also worried from about 2013 about the ill capacity of the state to plan. And uh, everybody says, now we are tired of planning, planning. I think we are tired of bad plans that take us nowhere, which has been characteristic of South Africa. We really needed tools to do work. So in that space, I actually searched for tools that we could use because we had put in front of the government tools that are from state SA, such as uh, the input output tables, the social accounting matrix, uh, the, 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 the growth accounting framework, uh, and uh, many other tools. But the weakness with these tools, they are backward looking. They are about a rear view mirror. So we searched for tools that are forward looking. And that's when we came uh, in contact with ADRS. I then talked to DPME and the Stats SA. I said, well, we should send our team to ADRS in California to go and understand these tools and their veracity, particularly to try and test the validity of the nine point plan. They went, they came back, I sent 14 of them and the team from Stats SA gave me a report and they said the nine point plan is not going to work. And then I presented the results to uh, my counterparts uh, of directors general generals, the directors general, they were not particularly pleased about this blunt and frank talk. But I said, now we need to go and embellish these tools and we must put them at the center of state capacity as part of the rubric of state capacity. Uh, well, I left in 2017 and uh, these tools were never, I mean, I, I, by the time I left, it was clear that the government was not keen on these things. I attended a meeting of the ANC. I was invited to come and uh, give a talk, uh, which I did. Uh, of course, it was after I, I talked at Matlante Foundation. And I, I said to the minister, because I said, minister, you will not have the planning systems unless people are trained. We need to invest in that. These things don't fall. And she called her director general there, Mbumi. And Mbumi called me at about 10. I said, Mbumi, I'll be there at 12 o'clock midnight if you need me. Uh, and the discussion never was taken forward because at the center was how do we get these tools? And then uh, Idla Meti was looking at scenarios and I said to them, colleagues, these scenarios, unless they are quantified, they are meaningless. Let's make sure that we quantify these scenarios. So Idla Meti picked on the scenarios and quantified them using ADRS uh, tools. And they generated a scenario for Guaraguara, a scenario for Naila Walk, and a scenario for 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 for, for uh, 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 Now, why are these scenarios important? Scenarios are important because they can politically mobilize. They are politically mobilizing. They are instruments for you to say, if we go to Naila Walk, there it is. And if there are tools of foresight, that scenario must be seen and be visible and be quantified. They must be socially desirable. They are socially desirable because South Africa is where we are now. We need a socially desirable path or rather a path that can be socially supported. At the moment we are in the doldrums and we know what is socially desirable as a country. And they must be proven to be economically feasible. And quantification is the act of making those feasible. Now my last slide is a summation of all this, those who have been engaged in thinking about the future of South Africa. In this regard, I'm having a business for South Africa and the targets that uh, they have uh, put forward. I'm looking at growing Houghton together where these scenarios were tested. I'm looking at national treasury and presidency targets for South Africa. And I'm looking at the ADRS report and I'm looking at specific indicators of foresight uh, that uh, we should actually say, is this adequate? If I look at uh, GDP outlook, 
Business for South Africa is looking at 840 trillion, 808 eight, 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 eight trillion uh, rands uh, in today's dollars. Of course, we have to look at purchasing power parities, but 800 trillion dollars, 8.3 trillion, they say is our GDP outlook. If we execute the things that Business for South Africa put on the table as plans, a thousand pages, they argue that debt to GDP ratio will come to 60%. S and P standards and poor rating and so on. Uh, and then of course they look at unemployment coming to 15%. Testing the modeling exercise that ADRS has done and adopting the scenarios, the state of the state of the province address by uh, Premier Makura said, we are choosing Naila walk scenario. And the Naila walk scenario will grow the economy of Kautem by 2 trillion by 2030. In, in 2010 rents. Poverty will be reduced to 16%. 3.1 million jobs will be there by 2030. Unemployment will drop to 15%. When you look at the National Treasury President's targets for SA, which are almost current and we are going to hear about them in quantification terms money-wise, because they are already there in the, sta in the state of the nation address. They are saying the economy of South Africa in terms of what they have looked at is 4.5 trillion rents. Compare that to uh, two trillion of counting. So counting will have half the economy of the country. It is 4.5 is half what business for South Africa says is the economy of South Africa. And it's two thirds or almost of ADRS report 6.4 trillion uh, GDP rents. They have not said what the debt to GDP ratio would be. They've said only 3.6 million jobs by 2030. Unemployment rate, of course, they didn't say what it will be, but we know it will be 30% because these things can be modeled. ADRS report that we have just had, 6.4 trillion GDP, debt to GDP ratio of 40%, jobs created eight to nine million, uh, up to 10 million. Unemployment drops to, from 27% to 12%. So, what then, given these tools of foresight, which one are we going to say is politically mobilizing, socially desirable, and economically feasible? The national treasury and presidency targets are not socially desirable, are not politically mobilizing. They are, of course, economically feasible. But they lack the other two elements. The target by uh, 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 the targets by business for South Africa are socially desirable. They are politically mobilizing and they are economically feasible, although they haven't shown how they will achieve them. The Houghton targets as a province for Houghton dwellers are actually socially desirable, politically mobilizing, and economically feasible because we have tested them in terms of options. The ADRS report itself has used evidence to create these socially desirable goals, politically mobilizing, and have proven as tools of foresight that these are socially, uh, these are economically feasible. The Idlamity Scenario Group is leading a charge for social compacts. And a social compact can only be visible and usable when it is socially desirable politically mobilizing and economically feasible. What is the conclusion? Our battery is low. The battery of government will be empty by 2030. That's the problem. But the battery of ADRS, of DGT, counting, growing counting together, and the one of a, a business for South Africa will be full by 2030. The question is, which battery do we choose? Thank you very much. I'm done, Nick. Nick, Am I can't Nick can't very believe much. that you were brief. <laughs> <laughs> well done, Fali. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And let me also just endorse what you're saying when we met at the Motlante Foundation Conference. 
that evidence based is is really powerful and what I really do like about the scenario and there are many things we can discuss about assumptions and about how do we coordinate between these different types of views of the future. The good news is we're generating them. And this particular scenario, although we might have a discussion where we agree or disagree with the policy implications, it's a logically consistent evidence-based analytical model. Now, of course, the problem with that is events change while you're busy doing the model, but, but that's just a complication. The fact is that it's a coherent and analytically based model for which I think much credit must be given to all of those involved. So thank you for that. I'm making the assumption the Deputy Minister's not with us. Um, if you are there, Deputy Minister, can you just uh, make yourself known? I don't think so. Um, so we're going to go to the, the panel now. And uh, the first uh, respondent is Dr. Mtabaseng Moleko, um, who is going to give her response to the, these, pic, the, these overviews. Um, she's based at Stellenbosch uh, University Business School, and it's a pleasure to meet you and to welcome you, Mtabaseng. Thank you so much for having me and a very good morning to um, the panelists and to everyone uh, that is here today. Thank you so much for in the invitation to join uh, you today for this discussion uh, to Asgar and to Dr. Lehotla. Uh, it's always a pleasure to uh, have such engagements. What I wanted to do colleagues is to, uh, as, uh, as Asgar was speaking, I was busy uh, loading some of his points so that I can respond specifically to uh, some of the inputs. So I just want to share uh, my screen if you'll allow me. But I think uh, we must accept and all agree that uh, we're really at a tipping point. And I don't know, I think we've passed uh, the tipping point as a nation, uh, really, where decisions should have been made, uh, taking us to an alternative path. Uh, what, I've, uh, what I've written now, which you will uh, what, what I've shared down the screen is really some of my assessment uh, on the input on the scenarios and also on the ADRS modeling. Uh, we had a process last year with uh, a group of economists together with Prof Swilling, uh, where we wrote on, I think my computer's frozen, <clears throat> where we wrote on, but I'll continue speaking, let me stop sharing. We wrote on what is necessary for South Africa to move into an alternative growth path? What is necessary for South Africa to change uh, the lackluster growth that it's currently uh, in? What are the necessary uh, conditions that we need to see put in place so that we can actually see a reformation of outcomes? And I think uh, it was clear from our side that to continue along the normal growth trajectory and the growth path that we're on is inadequate. Uh, unfortunately, my presentation seems to not want to uh, upload and I'm not sure why. Sorry, let me just uh, try to close my presentation and just reopen it. Uh, end of the show. It seems to be frozen. So we were very clear that there has to be an alternative. And I think that uh, the reason for the alternative was uh, formulated using various uh, economic assessment, economic um, analysis of South Africa's uh, investment growth path, the growth path, the economic indices are pertaining to various uh, subsectors, but also just uh, looking at the economic status quo of the country. And I'll share a little bit of that uh, today, but I think my main aim today is to really just to respond uh, to some of the inputs already made. I think I'm back. Yes, I am. So what, uh, what we saw, I think it's frozen again. So I'm just gonna share without sharing my slide because I can do that as well. It's not a transmission. So what I'm gonna share today is really some of the, uh, some of the underpinning uh, principles that guided uh, the views that I have on the inputs that ESGO has made, as well as some of the critical things that need to be reformed going forward. Uh, 
Number one, I think there's an acceptance that the state of the economy in South Africa is not only lackluster from the crises of COVID, but pre-COVID we experienced seriously lackluster growth and economic downturn on almost all indices. If we look at uh, unemployment, the labor market, the labor employment intensity, this was prevalently showing that uh, the state of the economy, uh, the level of investment, uh, capital intensiveness, uh, gross fixed capital formation, the level of public investment in regard to uh, the proportion to GDP. And I think it's important for us to look at the correct indices when we do this. Uh, if we don't look at the proper indices to assess the economic status of South Africa, we talk about numbers without looking at them as a proportion and ratio to the actual growth of GDP and GDP itself. So we saw that in the assessment we did, it's a report we did called New Wine into New Wine Skins, an alternative economic uh, framework uh, for this reconstruction of South Africa's economic uh, trajectory. It was clear that on most of these indices, South Africa wasn't performing well. We also uh, discovered if you look at the uh, exact analysis that uh, Asgar has made in terms of business as usual, i.e. if there had been no COVID, what would have been the outcome of the economic policy projections and trajectory? We also saw that again, and we used a lot of his analysis and also uh, making some of the scenario outcomes. And again, we saw the lackluster growth fixed between one to 2% remains a structural issue that South Africa has been unable to get out of, not just from the COVID situation, but also pre-COVID. We also saw that uh, the investment levels are unable to pull us out, the crowding in of investment as we had hoped for from a policy perspective, having embarked on the new liberal framework, hasn't been able to pull us out. We also saw unemployment is stubborn at 26.3% uh, if business as usual kept going. However, this is because again, of the low level of employment intensity, primarily because of the structural growth path that South Africa has had, which is mainly a services-led vis-a-vis a productive investment-led and transforming the economic pathways of investment capital and into productive investment sectors of the new economy. And a, a, a fourth thing that we found was that we are unable to see the uh, inclusion of new economic entrants in the main, particularly in new economic subsectors, and you're not seeing an expansion outward into these economic sectors of the more, greater majority of the population. And there's very little focus and emphasis of the oligopoly type structures of the economy and the control of various subsectors of the economy by three or four companies that control more than 80%. So there's very little emphasis on the kind of oligopoly type control structure of the value chains and the globalization of those value chains in the South African economy. And we don't talk much to that. We simply talk to growth and we simply talk to debt to GDP. We simply focus on indices that don't talk to what are the key drivers to the kind of economic outcomes that we are seeing? What are the key drivers to the tendencies that lead to the results that we are seeing now. And I think unless we focus on those as well, uh, there is going to be a problem with the type of response mechanisms that we have. So number one, uh, one thing that I was gonna start off by saying is that from a relief measure side, we've got to agree that you need short-term measures to try and resuscitate aggregate household demand but also you need long-term cyclical measures that are going to transform the growth path. These are two different things. And so the long-term mitigation measures and the short-term mitigation measures need to be tracked, need to be measured, need to be monitored. What we have not seen, and I think this is very imperative, and I think why the ADRS uh, modeling becomes very important, the Illuminati scenarios become important, is that if you don't measure the impact of your interventions and you're kind of hopeful for some kind of a wish list and kind of an impact or outcome that will result or emanate from your interventions, it is inadequate. You've got to plan to win. You've got to plan to make sure that you target unemployment, inefficiencies in the economy, market failures. You've got to plan to have different outcomes. But if your plans themselves are not showing you decisively how these issues are being dealt with sufficiently, we're gonna say, stay with the same kind of economic impediments I believe that we have seen and not to sufficiently uh, respond to uh, some of the failures of the outcomes. And so that's number one. So there's a difference between the short-term mitigation of COVID, but also you need to change the long-term growth path of South Africa because the structural 
growth path, which is a services-led economy based on debt, which grew the economy in the 2000s, has not been sufficient to actually deal with poverty, unemployment, inequality. All the indices are showing us that. Inequality is showing us that. Unemployment is showing us that. We're currently sitting at 42% unemployment, but we had 40% unemployment before COVID. 10.8 million people were outside of the labor market, not employed. 2.2 were shed because of the economic activity due to lockdown, but uh, stalled due to lockdown. But this was not necessarily because only of the crisis. The second point I want to share is that We've got to look at, is there a willingness from National Treasury and the Reserve Bank to implement alternatives? And is there a political will to have institutional coordination of these very important economic cluster bodies? They drive economic policy. They also determine the depth, I believe, of the efficacy of all the measures that are taken. If we don't look at the measures that National Treasury and also the Reserve Bank make use of in a coordinated fashion towards the same goal. So if the goal is to have a structural dependent part that is transformed, how then must the reform mechanisms and the implementation uh, mechanisms that are used be transformed. If we continue in this path, and we've seen with the business as usual path, it's going to lead us to retaining 2%. Treasury in their paper in 2019 reported 1 million jobs using their DSG modeling. So we know that with their own modeling, they have said that we will get only 1 million jobs uh, in addition to what we need. We know already each year, 1 million South Africans are added to the labor market. These are the school leaving learners. These are the entrance into the labor market per annum. But in 10 years, based on the microeconomic reforms that they've proposed in that paper, this is before COVID, they themselves admitted that they will only employ and absorb a million into the economy in 10 years. Surely this is inadequate. Surely this cannot be accepted as an economic recovery plan on any regard. And this is for, for me as an economist, uh, looking at the type of outcomes, we therefore, for me then says, whatever it is that we are employing in that economic modeling, in the DSG modeling, in the reforms that are within that, it's quite inadequate. And for us to accept that going forward would be a miss. I think that number three, we must accept that the fall in economic output unemployment prior to COVID suggests that South Africa has probably not done sufficiently and capably enough to reform the economic growth path. We've heard a lot in the last uh, few months, I think, there's a lot about the economic um, minerals and energy complex. There's a lot of discussion about the lackluster investment level. There's a lot of discussion about the uh, gross fixed capital investment formation, which is currently sitting around 17% to GDP. This is inadequate, even the investment level, the savings level. Uh, all the indices that talk to the behavior and the, and, and the performance of the uh, capital markets are showing us that even with the type of economic policies that we've had, we've been unable to show a transformation in the growth path. But not only a transformation, business confidence before COVID, investment level before COVID, uh, the uh, level of growth before COVID was already at less than 1%. So what you are seeing is that it, it requires, therefore, an acceptance that the fall of economic output, economic activity, wasn't necessarily COVID only. I think COVID is being used in a way uh, far more to cover up the failures, but COVID simply accentuated what already was. It worsened what already was. So I think that we must accept that pre-COVID, we have seen uh, South Africa's economic growth path really uh, failing. And uh, the economic indices are pointing us to this. Uh, I think the, the fourth point, what we need to do then is look forward. Looking forward, we need to assess, have the economic or, uh, stabilizers that have been put in place by the uh, stimulus of 500 billion been adequate? Are they efficient? Are they enabling the household demand to be boosted sufficiently? Is the fiscal multiplier effect is in being adequate to actually bolster uh, economic activity, right? You must remember the supply contraction on both sides of the economy requires stimulus coming from usually the fiscus. And it's a short-term 
uh, immediate measure whose timing is crucial in a time of recession or crisis. South Africa's recession and crisis has never been seen to this extent uh, post World War II. It has been at the worst level now. And unless something is done to quell the free fall, we will continue in this regard. So I think the economic inefficiencies we have to look at what are our real goals? Have we assessed sufficiently the stability that has been uh, implemented through the 500 billion? Has it been adequate? And we know already that the structure of the economic stabilizers, the, the, the 500 billion is made up of various components, the majority of which you show the financialization of South Africa because almost 40% without even looking at the other detail are going to credit guarantee schemes, which haven't been used. More than less than 10% has been used at 18 billion, and it's going to credit bank guarantees. And this speaks to how even the fiscal support is targeted, mainly skewed towards your big banks uh, and looking at those already on the existing balance sheet of big banks and not necessarily sufficiently looking at how do you reform these uh, growth paths into uh, transformative productive investment, uh, which is not happening. And we have seen with the 18 billion uptake that speaks to that, how much of that 500 billion has actually been made, made use of. And we know uh, if you refer to uh, some of the, the work that has been done by various economic agencies, one of them being IJ, they have uh, outlined that only 150 of the 500 billion has been used. And so if you look at the total proportion, has there really been a fiscal stimulus? And I think the answer would be no. In the context of austerity, in the context of a budget surplus being targeted in the three to five year uh, medium term expenditure framework, there hasn't necessarily been an austerity. And I think we have to look at what therefore are necessary economic stabilizers if we are to prevent the free fall. Otherwise, the free fall will continue if we don't put in place mechanisms uh, to respond to this. I think my last point that I will talk to um, is the issue of economic alternatives from a relation of looking at the capital markets, from the uh, looking at how will we finance an alternative? What are the necessary uh, tools that we can use and mechanisms that can be used to finance an economic alternative? And I know, as guys mentioned, the private sector in, uh, international support of uh, increasing investment over the next decade by using the PIC. I fully support this. Uh, the New Wine into New Wine Skin has a section which we talked to about uh, domestic resource mobilization. Uh, we fully support the use of capital markets, the use of the Reserve Bank uh, in partnership with the National Treasury to try and not only cheapen cost of credit, uh, make sure that liquidity in the market is increased, but also use alternatives. Borrowing doesn't have to be the only form uh, from multilateral agencies of making use of capital. I use a term that talks about disciplining capital. Um, it's important to look at how the East Asian economies in times of economic crises, how even European uh, economies, how even the Brits, the US have used their central banks in a way that bolsters lending to the government, lending to the government, but also improving liquidity in the markets, but tailoring it to revenue generating output enhancing productive investments, which has not been the case when you look at the trail of private sector capital extension in South Africa's economy. Mainly it's gone to mortgage finance, loan finance, consumptive spending, not necessarily productive investment. And that requires an alternative use of capital markets and also capital markets to drive an alternative growth path and investment pathway for South Africa. I would have shown you some slides here that show a lot of the detail of the facts, but I can explain them well as I'm explaining them here. But I think what is critical is that there are alternative financing methods. We need to get our caps off this debt to, from um, Bretton Woods IMF institutions. We need to look at, are we having domestic resources that we can mobilize? I believe we have. Can we now use these efficiently towards capital intensive and productive investments using what we call the economic complexities and some of the frontier sectors, particularly we've outlined in ours, when you look at the trade and industrial policy imperatives, those that have a high labor absorptive capacity, but also those that have ability uh, to have multiply and value chain effects up and downstream for South Africa. We don't currently uh, assume that all the trade policy imperatives and all the um, programs are necessarily 
improving our industrialization as a proportion to GDP. If you look at manufacturing value add and you look at the component of exports, has it transformed over the last 20 to 25 years in South Africa? Have you seen an overall uh, improvement of some of the subsectors in terms of their contribution or is it the same minerals, commodities, raw that are being exported, very little beneficiation. Um, what type of products are we exporting? Are we able to even make use of the ACFA and the uh, ratification of this uh, African Continental Free Trade Agreement? Who will be the beneficiaries? Will it be oligopolies? Will it be new entrants? Will it be new SMMEs that enter into the value chains? Currently, if we look at South Africa's current economic framework and structure, we have been unable to do this. And I think that the economic malaise in South Africa speaks to some of the structural inhibitions that are there because of the type of finance and the finance that is not necessarily being availed uh, to this alternative growth path that we see. Um, I would have shown a slide that shows the um, use of different type of capitals and different type of um, capital rather uh, in the different asset classes that can be used. And we're not talking about, um, particularly when you talk pension funds, people jump to prescribed assets. No, you're talking about creating of an infrastructure asset class as an example to deal with the finance gap. So infrastructure finance asset class to deal with the finance gap, what you need to look at is where is there a finance gap? So an example is we're talking about crowding in private sector investment and driving private sector as the main driver of some of the uh, infrastructure funding that is needed, uh, particularly with the infrastructure fund that the government has set up. Is this going to happen? Is it likely that we are going to see crowding in of private sector investment? The likelihood is that if the government leads with the infrastructure investment drive, we know that the revenue in terms of the budget balance, the deficit is widening to almost 15%. There is a, a shortage in terms of fiscus, 300 billion shortage. All of these things point to the fact that the government cannot necessarily sustain without looking at other alternative domestic resource mobilization um, sources. So we need to look at what are the other sources and alternatives. And one of them we need to look at is the infrastructure asset class and the use of our pension funds in a more, uh, in a more sustainable way that drive this inclusive growth path, this equity and this type of, uh, this type of alternative growth path. This would then, why do you do this? You wanna crowd in FDI, you wanna crowd in private sector investment, you wanna crowd in private sector investment. But right now, because all of these other indices are constrained, you need to then use the muscle of the state the policy of this, the policy regime of the state, particularly within the capital markets, to almost crowd in this investment. And this is also not a long-term measure, but it's a short-term measure to also uh, what I'd call resuscitate the economy and to also improve uh, the and, and boost both the supply and the, and the aggregate uh, demand side. So I think in terms of um, comments, I'll stop there. Uh, there's a lot I could add here, but I think what is clear is that we do need an alternative the um, current uh, the current economic structure of South Africa points to a very uh, poor secondary sector contribution over the last 30 years, even 50 years. Let's not look at one year. The secondary sector sector contribution, particularly when you look at manufacturing value added as a contribution to GDP, has constrained, has contracted. The primary sector contribution has declined over the last 50 years. We know this, but what we are looking at is how do we change uh, the South African outcomes so that you have a different long-term development trajectory that improves social outcomes, that improves inequality and poverty indicators, but also improves unemployment. And for us to continue along these paths and act like you know, when the budget speech is announced, we get another rating downgrade, we work for the you know, credit rating agencies is not going to help us at all. We need to completely rewire and review ourselves. And I think very important as, uh, as a former statistician general has mentioned, we don't necessarily put sufficient uh, regard in the outcomes using the planning models of some of the imperatives that uh, Treasury wants to put in place. The outcomes show already that the poor outcomes are not going to be sufficient to deal with the inequality, the structural inefficiency, the market failures of inclusion. And okay. therefore, we cannot just continue as is. I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ntabe Singh. Uh, very interesting and insightful comments. And I think it gives us a lot to talk about as to whether we really are on the same page or not. So thank you for that.
Let me uh, now ask Isa to uh, comment. As I mentioned, he's at Alexander Forbes, so the floor is yours. I'm just mindful of time that we give, we've got a big list of people on the, on the group, so I'm keen we have some general discussion. When Isa's finished, I'll give the floor briefly to Askar, and then we're gonna open it up for lots of comments, follow what's on the chat, and uh, Isa, the floor is yours. Thank you, and Tabisang. Are you there, Isa? Oh, we can't hear you, you must be on mute. Okay, we've got you on the screen. Can we hear you? No, we can't hear you. So I'll just ask Kanozipo just to uh, make uh, sure. Nick, yes. uh, the organizer didn't take control from me. Ah. Uh, if they can take uh, the reins from me. Uh, okay. Not that I'm a doctor, I wouldn't have uh, intentions of me. So you always have to go hand out him, But uh, they should take over control. And I think oh. that's what also stopped uh, Professor Muleko from getting uh, her presentation across. Ah, okay. No, Zipa, yes, are you uh, there? They can get the, the rights from me. Uh, no, I have Zipa. no intention are you there? No, of keeping uh, control. Yes, I am here. I'm trying Can to sort it out. That, please. Yes. Apologies to you, and Tabi saying if that will cause the problem. Sipo, can you make sure we can uh, hear Issa, please? I am on it, Nick. Thank you. Maybe while they try, can you hear me? Yeah. Now we can hear you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the, present, the two presentations that happened and the first response. I'm going to make a couple of points, uh, let's say about six points, and then I will show some three slides that reinforces the points that have been just made uh, by the previous speaker. From the two presentations, it is very clear that, which is the first point, it's very clear that the business as usual economic management that we have had over the last two decades is no longer fit for purpose. It, it, it takes too long uh, to improve inequality, to generate jobs, uh, and also in terms of making sure that the benefits of the economic progress, uh, however, very slow, it takes too long through the trickle down economics uh, that we have had. Inequality has increased or remained quite high. The reduction in unemployment takes too long, but we see in terms of inequality, the wealth gap continues to, to increase. So clearly something drastic has to, has to change. Then the second point, which is something that we all agree on, COVID-19 did not cause the decline or the slow progress in economic growth. It essentially just accentuates or worsens the same things that we have always known. So in responding to COVID-19, we also need to bear in mind that what comes after or what comes out of the policy measures we make is something that is different to what we've had uh, especially if we want to generate a new economy that is able to, to deal with the, uh, the social ills that we have. Thirdly, on macroeconomic reforms, the presentations emphasize that fiscal policy is on an austerity mode. But if we look at the numbers, we have a fiscal deficit of 15% roughly, which is the largest outside of wartime periods. That can be called anything else but austerity. It's not sufficient, uh, it's inadequate, but it is hardly austerity. On monetary policy, there is an emphasis of changing the mandate of the Reserve Bank from the current inflation targeting to a dual mandate of growth and inflation. Some would say a, a, a dual mandate of employment and inflation. That may well be uh, uh, something to consider. But if we look in terms of the economy that is largely run on credit, 
credit requires people to have collateral, to have access to it, or to have a source of income to actually have access to credit, which is problematic in the South African context, given that those that we seek to improve or to uplift in the economy are outside of the, um, you know, they don't have collateral, they don't have the income to actually get into the credit market. So by design, a credit run system will regenerate uh, inequality rather than reducing it. There is a lot of research that shows that monetary policy loosening, particularly for countries that have low employment levels, uh, leads to an increase in inequality rather than a, de a decline. How does that happen? In the South African context, you loosen monetary policy, those that have assets or those that have uh, ample income, they buy assets. And when the economy improves, asset price increases, their wealth also increases. And through that wealth, new income is generated, which means their income also increases. Yes, job growth happens when monetary policy is loosened, but the impact of the wealth effect is far larger compared to the impact of the income effect. So yes, monetary policy may need to be looked at differently in terms of uh, it helping in terms of reducing inequality, uh, particularly wealth inequality. Maybe we could say perhaps monetary policy is not geared, is not designed to deal with inequality. That must be done through the tech system. But over the last two decades, we have failed to reduce inequality through the tech system. So something must happen that changes the way that we spend uh, uh, public, public funds. The fourth point, which was on social security, it's good to cushion those that have lost jobs. It's good to make sure that the impact of COVID-19 is reduced as far as possible to make sure that when the economy, when we eventually get a, a solution to COVID, we have little scars to the economy such that we can then focus on growing the economy without having to repair the damage of COVID-19. But in well-functioning economies, the, you know, those that depend on social security must decrease in number. <laughs> they must not increase because the economy must be able to generate enough jobs for people to be able to take care of, of themselves. The moment we find ourselves increasingly inc uh, uh, raising the level of or the number of people that continue to receive social grants, then it means something is wrong because over the long term, it's not going to be sustainable. And then the fifth point, which is on microeconomic reforms, which is where I'll show a few slides, three slides uh, uh, that will show that the South African economy is not structured for growth. If we look across other emerging economies whose average growth over la the last decade has been about 3.7%, they have an overrepresentation in sectors such as agriculture, in sectors such as manufacturing, in sectors such as energy and construction. South Africa has an underrepresentation. It seems I can't share my slides. I don't have the rights uh, to share my slides. So I'm just going to talk through the points. So that structure of the economy that we have uh, necessarily reinforces the same kind of economic outcomes that we have had. And it is also reinforced by the fact that from a capital markets point of view, a point that was raised by, my, uh, by, by the previous speaker, South Africa has two characteristics some similar to other countries, but in other ways, it's not similar to, to others. So how is it similar? We have seen a decline in the number of listed companies across a number of countries, largely developed economies, and South Africa is part of the, that characteristic, even though it is an emerging market. So from the mid nineties, from about 900 listed companies to uh, 2019, where we have just over 350 listed companies. So there is a decline in the uh, opportunity set for traditional long-term investors. The second point is we have seen the level of market concentration increase quite significantly. 
from 300, I mean, from 150% of GDP in 2000 to 300% of GDP in 2019. It means it's too risky, too concentrated because the opportunity set has declined, which then coincide with, in terms of solving part of these things, we have to look at the structure of the economy where South Africa under invests in agriculture, it under invests in manufacturing, energy and construction. So if we look in terms of how the long-term saving sector has invested, just taking the JSC SWIX for instance, even looking at the share of the four sectors that I mentioned in the total economy, they still invest far too low shares compared to their current shares, which means they reinforce the very same structure that is not geared for growth. There lies a convergence between what we require to see from an economic development point of view to what is required by the pension fund industry in terms of augmenting returns through things like infrastructure investment. So there is no trade-off between financial returns, economic development, and economic growth. Considering the fact that part of the economy that, uh, uh, that, that we, we, we need to develop lies in the outside of the listed market, which is where a lot of the asset managers need to look increasingly. But as the sixth point, the role of the private sector in the presentations was not emphasized enough. It seems the advent of COVID has brought in the, the era of big governments, which is okay for dealing with pandemics in the same way that it is the right way for dealing with wars. But outside of pandemics and wars, the role of the private sector needs to be elevated. The private sector by and large is a better allocator of capital compared to government. We know how government have spent over a trillion rand that we have increased in debt over the last decade, but we have very little to show for it in terms of developments, in terms of infrastructure. So that at face value can be a proof to say government has been a bad allocator of capital. Had that funding been available to the private sector, perhaps we could have had different outcomes. Of course, in the current economic structure, perhaps it would not have reduced uh, inequality to a large extent, given that the, the economy is, is not geared to reducing, to reducing uh, uh, inequality. So I would have expected the role of the private sector to increase or to be explained, located in the various economic reforms that we, that we, that we are talking about. I think uh, President Becky wrote e, e, two weeks or three weeks ago, looking at the different economic reforms that have been suggested from the national treasury to government to business for SA. And he does mention or point out this fact that we, 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 we do not see the suggestions that came out of business for SA featuring to a large extent in what government is doing. But at the same time, Government is putting the infrastructure investment at the center of how we are going to recover out of this. Yet the role of business that is supposed to drive much of that activity is not emphasized. That I think it's a, it's a, it's a shortcoming that, that, that we need to, to also look at. But also what comes out of the presentations is there's an implicit assumption that the institutional framework is going to just fall into place for us to get growth. What we have been presented with is a tool of analysis, but it leaves a lot of what is required to make those simulations come to reality. The capacity of the state, which Dr. Lehotla mentioned when he was still a state surgeon general, he was concerned about, nothing much has changed to improve the capacity of the state. But at the same time, because of COVID, we have this push for a big involvement by the government that we know its capacity has declined significantly. Do we expect the same government to be able to implement the economic reforms that are required if we know for sure that its capacity has declined? I'm not sure if we're taking uh, that point into account to a large extent because without the state being capable to implement the economic reforms, 
we can as well just forget about the ability of the private sector to come and play a, a, and play a bigger part in improving economic growth. The institutions, they have been weakened quite significantly. We will not be able to implement much of the reforms without the institutions being rebuilt. So the presentations takes for granted that these institutions need to be fixed first before we can actually see better implementation of reforms, before we can actually see the private sector coming to play ball. The last point that I want to mention is, even in the event that we are able to implement the economic reforms that makes the cost of business low, that makes access or entrance of new players into the economy easier, the private sector will not, which is what we observe internationally, does not come out of benevolence to come and invest in the economy. They need incentives. In the US over the last four years, we saw Donald Trump cutting taxes for corporates. That was incentivizing the private sector to invest in the US economy. We are not seeing anything similar in the South African context. We assume or we take for granted that once the economic reforms are there, once we reduce red tape, once we deal with corruption, the private sector is just going to come and fall into place. No, it's not because there are many other economies that are in competition with us to fight for this investment and are doing a lot more to incentivize the private sector to come and invest. So I think that's one thing that we need to see more being emphasized in the uh, scenarios to say where exactly. So essentially apportion the roles and responsibilities to each sector of society. What is government's role? What is the private sector's role? And how does the government make it um, uh, possible or enables the private sector to invest to actually list the specific things that are required? Because to speak in broad terms, that's like not that's like having a destination without having an itinerary how to get there. So what we have currently is a plan to go to a destination, but our itinerary is littered with um, uh, omissions of how do we get there. And I think that is one thing that we may need to to put more into our into our plans. Thank you very much. Thank you, Isa. Um, well, I think that's a very useful contribution, and I think what it does and apologies for not being able to see your slides, is raise the, the, the central false or correct dilemmas on the trade-offs uh, between the choices that you and, uh, and, and the other presenters have been putting on the table. And I seem to remember from my first economics class that we had a thing called Minimax. In other words, we want to find the consensus in the middle that is the best mix of policy choices, realizing, I think, I would suggest, maybe some of you will comment on this, that there is a, a way forward that maximizes the social justice and maximizes the type in, of investment that you might uh, have been referring to. This is the dilemma. Anyway, let's see where we go. I'm following the chats. Um, the, we haven't heard back from the minister's office, I'm afraid. So I'm going to give the floor back to Askar to see if he'd like to uh, comment on, uh, on uh, the panelists' response. So thank you again, okay. to both of you, and uh, Tabi Singh and Isa, and the floor is yours, Eskar. Okay, well, thank you very much. I, I think there's a lot of <laughs> stuff has come up, and I assume that the, uh, when you open the floor, some of the, some of the issues will be, you know, uh, uh, there will be engagement with them you know, uh, uh, by the people who are, you know, also uh, uh, present. Um, I think um, the, uh, one of the issues that is, that is, I think we are emphasizing is the need for a policy roadmap. Um, there are a lot of, uh, discussions that are, you know, uh, there is no silver bullet that there is a one set of issues will solve the, uh, uh, the problem. We have run many, many thousands of simulations over the years and, and, and there is really the South African challenge 
of low growth, high unemployment, high poverty rate and inequality, it is not, you know, uh, it is not possible to, to, to with, there's no silver bullet. At the same time, uh, they, uh, that means basically, um, you know, uh, ring fencing uh, policies, especially macroeconomic policy, which has a, a large number of, you know, policy tools in that in there. If we ring fence that, I think we find that that the, the uh, you know uh, uh, the likelihood of achieving you know major changes over the next ten years or any period of time will 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 be very low. Um, so in that sense, for example, the discussions that was you know uh, that Isa was saying about the macroeconomic policy reform, uh, I agree. I mean, it is not the Treasury's macro policies. We did the uh, scenarios on that uh, before and checked the you know uh, simulated its impact by its own. It is not. It is not enough to do much of a change. And 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 part of the problem I think that the South Africa right now is we having is that it seems. It seems that the state is trying to lower the expectation of the population in terms of what to expect over the next 10 years. As far as I remember from mid 90s, there've been always discussions about targeting five, 6% growth rate and every growth document that has come out has been basically stayed in that, that, that area. And even GEAR very explicitly says that 3% growth is not going to take us anywhere in a very explicit way, you know, uh, uh, says that. And and uh, uh, others have tried to get the five six percent. Now it seems like we are getting uh, the, this. The what what I think is coming out of the state is that talking about three percent average growth, a million or two million jobs, which means basically in ten years time the economy is going to be with this. Some of these uh, the the baseline simulations are going to be the reality in, in by twenty thirty. So I think. By, and and the, the, the major problem there, in my view, is that the state is trying to focus on the, on the supply side measures to bring about, you know, uh, to deal with the jobs, deal with inequality, deal with, the, with the, all the, the issues that the uh, party, you know, referred to, with a very few uh, policy tools and, and, and an, an orientation also that says to deal with the issue of the debt GDP ratio that they making an issue out of it in a much bigger than it should be. That has to be first, we got to get sort that out, even if it comes to killing the growth of the economy before we get uh, to do anything else. I think that path towards solid dealing with, uh, with debt through you know, austerity, through uh, you know, cuts and trying to get a uh, primary balance positive primary balance over the next two years or so is 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 is, is where I think we'll, we'll move the economy more toward the Guara Guara scenario of the Indul Lumiti rather than to to putting the economy on the right on a uh, on a path. And and I think this issue I think is 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 is, is if, if they expect if 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 this really um, develop roots that that over the next 10 years average three percent growth is 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 what the economy is, is going to, you know, deliver. Uh, given all the other issues that, uh, especially in Tabiseng, uh, uh, raised and 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 also Aiza uh, raised, the, the the issue of the unemployment rate and poverty inequality will will be, you know, even uh, worse. Uh, um, I think uh, the uh, the issue of of I think the other issue that uh, that uh, party also referred to and and it came up. Um, there is also one of the things that we are emphasizing again is that issue of the policy roadmap because there have been also a lot of discussions, a lot of documents that sets up a, a set of uh, vision or, or, or ten year, you know, uh, uh, goal. But how do we get there is not clear. And I think what Indulumiti did with the, the three scenarios and the quantification that we did, yes, we can discuss, as Nick said, you know, we can discuss about details, but the, the, the endeavor of, of saying, look, if we want to, let's figure out the difference between trickle down uh, is, is bourgeois, immiserizing growth of the Guara Guara and proper growth of the uh, uh, Naila walk, 
what does it translate into policy mix? Uh, is it, you know, uh, what, what distinguishes this in terms of use of the different policy tools uh, that, uh, that are available in the, the country? And I think that quantification, that modeling work, is, is, was unique in the sense that, that, uh, that then the uh, set of vision for the country went beyond just setting up a good feeling vision. And, and, and started looking at the, the, the contestations on the issues of the policies, uh, which I think the, uh, that, that was you know, uh, the, the important in, in my view and, and can be you know, uh, useful. I am not you know, um, sure about the, um, some of the, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with the, uh, some of the issues that I you know, referred to, uh, but I think in terms of if, if if he thinks, you know, if you're saying that we are, it's not austerity that's going on in South Africa, or it is being proposed over the next two years, then I think we are, we differ on that. Um, on the issue of the monetary policy, I think it's interesting observation you are uh, making, and I think the issue of the monetary policy, and then you're looking at the wealth effects, and, and, and whether you're acknowledging that it will have real effects if we have the monetary policy issue is monetary policy in South Africa is, is different. And I think that is the part that needs to be looked at. If you look at the interest rate policy, it, it, it affects the, the, the debt GDP ratio. It, it continues the high, the high interest rate, historically high interest rate policy of South Africa is one of the reasons the South African debt GDP remains high. The, it is, it is a, 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 it's very difficult in terms of on the households, in terms of uh, household consumption expenditures on durable goods and housing on cars or whatever the spending and, and, and on the manufacturing sector. I think as, as the, uh, uh, the uh, Rob Davies, uh, the, uh, the previous you know, uh, trade minister said, without the macroeconomic reform in South Africa, the trade and industry is not gonna, the, the investments, the increase in investment manufacturing, changing in the improving manufacturing sectors that is, is not gonna, we need that ma macroeconomic support. Uh, uh, to happen. Um, social security, I, I think you're very right. And, and actually, if you look at the, uh, the report, the, 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 the simulation model, as the economy grows in the, in the scenarios that we have um, in the report, and, and become those job creation of, of moving toward a high level of job creation, the demand for social security drops. It is endogenous, the demand is and it's a means tested as people find jobs and getting jobs, they, 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 the number of the, uh, whether it is, you know, uh, different uh, demand, whether it is child support grant or, or disability grants or, or um, any of the uh, grants that are all, all of them are, are means tested, they drop significantly. Uh, but to the extent that the South African economy remains low growth, high unemployment, then you expect the social security to remain, the demand for social security and its cost to also remain high. So our actually our simulations is, is showing what, you know, uh, the, the, at the end, the, 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 the dependency ratio goes down uh, significantly. Uh, on the issue of where the private sector needs more incentive, that is, you know, uh, uh, the issue of the, uh, I think, you probably are a little bit more conservative than uh, more orthodox thinking than than I, but but I think the question of put it down in a specific form so that if if on the modeling side one can be integrated into the into the private sector part of the support that would be uh, on the you know in terms of policy uh, what exactly what type of incentive are we talking about and 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 uh, what is you know uh, uh, that is that can be that the society can afford and it is in the benefit of of the society as a whole and then then one can you know uh, easily integrate it into simulation this is all what if scenarios we can e easily change it include it include other measures and run the models you know differently but i think it needs to be more than also a statement about the private sector needs more incentive um, and i think that's part of what party is also pushing is saying look the private sector has put together a good set of targets for the economy but in terms of how do you get there they're unclear and and and, and as long as that, that is unclear it remains just a good feeling in terms of five, six percent growth rates or reducing unemployment rate, reducing inequality, but but the path, the policy path is missing in there. And I think that's one of the issues 
what what are the uh, how how the uh, the private sector is proposing to achieve the uh, those targets would help also this work. I leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ashkar. We have uh, still an hour to go, and I'm going to suggest that we take a, a short break, just a little leg stretch, a biology break, maybe a cup of tea or coffee, uh, so that we can really open this up to what I hope will be a fruitful discussion about how we, how we take this work forward. Um, I'm reminded of a cartoon I saw many years ago of some kids uh, at school after the teacher had been teaching a long time, and kid in the front row put up his hand and he said, can I go home now? My brain is full. Uh, so it's certainly been a stimulating discussion and got me thinking about these dilemmas. I mean, let me just make the obvious point, two obvious points. We have less time than we think, and you guys are critical to taking this forward because many, many South Africans who matter do not follow the complexities of this discussion and the trade-offs and are simply either demoralized, frustrated or angry, and we really are not getting this right. So I'm hoping in this last hour, when we come back, we'll hear some specific proposals that we have in common. What, what's the shared agenda here? Um, what, what, what are the, the no, obvious no-brainers where there's enough consensus that we know we should do this because it leads to the second point, which you've just touched on is, how, so how do we make this stuff happen? If I think of all the think tanks, the Nedlax and the Mistras and the Planning Commission and Treasury and DPME, you know, we're in the neighborhood, we've got all the institutions in this country. It's time that we exercise some choices and thought harder about making it happen than, than debating all the policy choices endlessly although I think it's a rich discussion. So I'm gonna declare a, a five minute biology break and uh, we will meet at 11.02 uh, and uh, recommence for the last hour. I'm very pleased that Samadora Som Fikeni has joined us. He's going, been listening and he's going to try and pull it together a bit. So let's just have a quick five minute leg stretch. Zoom. Such a weird sensation talking to a screen, but I hope you're all uh, in the Zoom room. I was thinking uh, uh, now about an old joke, uh, watching the Texan um, snow, and it reminded me of an old story about when they had floods in, in Texas many years ago, and the river burst its banks, and uh, uh, it was a tremendous flood. And so it went right up to the first floor of, of the church and a, a motorboat came by looking for people to pick up and they called out to the priest to say come come get on the boat and we'll rescue you and the priest said no 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 the divine will look after me heaven will look after me and so they left him and 12 hours later it was at the second floor another boat came by and they made the same offer we'll rescue we'll rescue and he said no i'll be looked after don't worry heaven, you know, heaven will look after me and uh, about six hours later, the priest was swept away and, and sadly drowned. Anyway, when he got to the other place, he was very upset and uh, he summoned the authorities and he said, how come you let me down? All my life I have been good and I've served you and, and suddenly you know, I'm not looked after. Why didn't you send help? And they look at him and they look up the spreadsheets and they see what happened. They said, we sent you two boats. So, <laughs> I'm like that as a job. Um, we've got enough help, we've got enough brain power in this room. And what always strikes me about South Africa is we've got all the institutions and the smarts. And yet somehow either the chemistry or I don't know, something keeps us from actually getting on with it fast enough for the people of this country. Last Sunday, I drove through the Eastern Free States in the back roads and uh, I just couldn't believe the state of the roads and the conditions of the towns in the Eastern Cape, it is horrifying the suffering, poverty, the lack of opportunity, really quite something. So let's get open the debate. I, I took a call from Paddy during the break and he asked uh, uh, during the break and he asked to make a comment. So I'm going to let him do that. But if you just like to pop your hands up uh, so that I can get some kind of speaker's order, uh, we're going to open this up for discussion and comments now. Whatever you like to say, please say if you disagree or if you support or if you've got a proposal on how we take this forward, because my mind is very exercised by this as to how do we work together as people who have the kind of policy expertise that are in this conversation. So let me start with probably a quick two minutes from you. 
No, thank you very much. Uh, I, I was a co-presenter with Asga, uh, although I took uh, just under 10 minutes. I thought that uh, I was very deliberate by saying very little on the private sector and uh, the contribution they made in a thousand pages, which was reduced to 120 pages. What we do know that is that uh, there wasn't a process by which government could absorb that because they don't have tools. In large part, therefore, that contribution by the private sector was left unattended to. Mm -hmm. It's a travesty that we shouldn't accept as a nation. What the NEDLEC agreement therefore emerged as was devoid of that contribution by the private sector. And in the way those contributions are made, it's an eclectic process with provinces where they tie a few things with the private sector rather than at the policy level arranging this in a systematic way. What does that uh, become? If you think about the uh, state of the nation address, what was very clearly not there in the state of the nation address, or that was there which uh, have constituted the contestation, always treasury contested the master plans. Always uh, the minister of uh, trade and industry said the macroeconomic. Always the contestation was labor saying the labor laws are fine. What was absent in the state of the nation address or what was present by its absence was that that conflict had been resolved. And that conflict meant give us the macroeconomic, give us the master plans, don't tamper with the labor laws. And then Nedlec agreed on a compromised NEDLEC agreement, which is the lowest denominator you can actually come to. And that's where we are compromised as a nation. Uh, so we, 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 that work by business has to be detailed and looked into, added into the whole thing. Because if you look at uh, uh, growing out and together, which uh, ADRS has worked on, by looking at the province and the 160 projects that they worked on, they add a distinct 1.7 percentage points on the already five percentage points growth. That gives us 6.7%. If you are selective and working on these things that business put together, and we, that is systematically processed, who knows? We may get about 2%. What is the value of that? The value of that is this. The business has proposed projects now, by bringing those projects through this modeling exercise, you have actually integrated from project into policy frameworks, and you have created a socially mobilizing instrument of evidence that government can now appropriate and society can have access to, and everybody, and it it through visioning and social compact can make use of. Leaving that out as we have done shows that we are not very serious about what needs to be done. So we need that work of, and that's why President Beck says, let's meet in June and really go into very deep planning. Because all these things that we call plans have not been plans and we are tired of bad plans. That's what South Africans are saying. Mm -hmm. And uh, everybody says, no, we are not, we lack implementation. No, it's not about implementation. You can't implement a bad plan. It will give you a bad result. A bad plan is not implementable. And if you don't have tools of aggregation and eye of the needle, we'll never get out of this morass. We better take ourselves seriously and do the right things. So thanks, Chair. That's my contribution that I wanted to make. Thanks, Pali. I'm just going to follow up if I can and ask you this. So given that we do have so many institutions and think tanks, you know, whether they're formally in government or quasi-government or NGOs or foundations, what is the mechanism of pulling that June discussion together that you referred to? I don't know. I mean, uh, to the extent possible, the, the experiment, this uh, putting the model together at the province level has been tested. And how to building, putting, growing how to together is there as an experiment. And Premier Makura Sona was anchored on this. He has to know, now address the nation again. And the major constraint is this macroeconomic framework that makes the provinces only places where you give social grants and education, but you don't do serious industrial 
upon policy. And you can't do it because it is sitting with national department and the DSG CGE model that Treasury uses is not a it's not a long term. I suppose what I'm asking. I, I suppose what I'm asking is what is the super convening trigger or process or institution? Well, we need to meet the president and talk to him about this. Mm. That's the only way we can get to this point. Mm. And then he can express himself. And when I say president, saying president and his cabinet, mm. I say, look, these are our worries as a nation. These are the tools that are available. Show us your tools. Mm. And as a former bureaucrat, I know we don't have the tools. Mm. And uh, we are clinging to the, the pockets of power Mm. Uh, and we, we disable everybody else to do what they have to do. And I think uh, the tools and the, the, the steps, Houting has already put something together and says, we'll generate 3.1 million jobs as a province against a government that says a nation will produce 2 million jobs in, 30, in 10 years. Now we must discuss this thing of Houting and say, what are these policy contradictions? Mm. And how do we resolve them? Okay. Because Houting has to fight the national now and Got further it. precipitating the disquiet. So we really need to do, second, this work that uh, the, the uh, government, uh, uh, private sector has done, has to be brought into uh, the, 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 the tools and the uh, ADRS has the possibility of doing that. Uh, and let, let's do it so that uh, we can move faster to, to, to bring these things. The problem, uh, Nick, is this. Now government says 3% uh, moderate growth is fine for as long as it's consistent and in 10 years, we'll have it. Now they have lowered the bar to 3%, which actually will be empty by 30, by, by 2010. Mm. And they want us to believe that. It can't be. Mm. So we need to stick to the 6% that businesses, if I were uh, the president, once business came with those targets, I would lock the door, throw out the key, and say, I like the targets. Let us talk of how we achieve them. But we are not leaving this room until we agree on these targets. Mm. or rather not agree, the targets I've agreed to, we need the roadmap to taking us to that to those targets. For the first time, business in South Africa said, we want this because we cannot survive without it. That's a big commitment. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you for that. I, I recall the Malaysians did exactly that. They locked the political party, the states, um, some opposition, not that they had allowed much, uh, and the unions and society in the room until they came up with a national plan. It was called Vision 2020. They did that in 1995. Okay, and it was a real plan. All right, good. Let's get some comments. The floor is open now. Uh, so please raise your hands uh, or come into the conversation. And I'm asking the controllers to make sure if we can, that we can see uh, the contributors because we've been struggling with that. So let's uh, see who would like to enter this debate. Hi, Nick. Um, yep. I was just going to, uh, I wanted to answer your question. I see no one saying anything. I wanted to just make a point before before the others came in, just to stress um, one of the things that I think we need to, the problem in South Africa that we need to emphasize, the problem in the country, particularly with economic policy, we must accept that there's varied interests groups, there's varied um, outcomes, depending on whatever mode you take and whatever uh, interest group that you support, i.e. whether you're looking at big business, whether you're looking at social uh, programs, uh, whether you're looking at uh, the type of mechanisms that you utilize, all of them have varied outcomes. But now the question that we are constantly sitting and pitting with in South Africa is that what we have seen with the, and I want to use the COVID example of the efficacy and the movement of the state in a, in a parallel fashion where everyone is bought in one. This for me, I wanted to answer your question as what must be done to move us forward? Mm -hmm. We have got to use the same type of institutional arrangement from the level of the presidency all the way down to local government. So what we have not seen from economic policy, and this is where we have hemorrhaged literally from an economic perspective, the COVID hit us March. Uh, we closed economic sectors for almost two months that led to the continued bleeding of all economic se sectors up to 90% quarter two. This continued in quarter three. This was ongoing for almost seven consecutive quarters even now. So 
we then only got a plan, which is a reported economic recovery plan in the time when it was, a, the date was the 15th of October. I remember the exact date. This is more than six months after we were in to the problem of COVID. So one, there has been no urgency from the state in response to the economic crisis, which is ongoing. So if you are serious about dealing with the economic crises, you have got to, from an institutional perspective, respond differently. We have seen with the pandemic, what the state did was to have a national coordinating council. You have got to have at the level of the economic cluster, at the level of local government, at the level of bringing in the private sector, NEDLAC is inadequate for the level of crisis South Africa is in. To respond adequately, you've got to have a coordinating council. And it's not enough to have this advisory council of the president that seems to meet, I don't know when and what they're discussing, but whatever it is that is happening there, it seems disjointed from what Treasury is doing. It's disjointed from what everyone else from the medium term budget policy statement, NEDLAC, there doesn't seem to be coordination. That's number one. For, for, for I think for me, imperative is that for anything to happen, we've got to see the president giving leadership on the economy because the crisis is ongoing. Now, how does that happen? Have the same type of command council with all the ministers, Minister Patel, Minister um, of Small Business, the ministers of the different legs on the economic cluster. You've got to bring the DFIs on board. The DFIs are critical in releasing capital and finance to SMMEs. You've got to bring the trade policy on board. All the uh, the different institutions of the DTIC that are relating to trade tariffs policy. All of these means and mechanisms have to be reviewed quickly, looked at to see what are the variants that need to be changed? What are the mechanisms that need to be implemented now in the short term and then in the long term, what can be moved? We've got to move together. The Reserve Bank must be in that discussion. The National Treasury Minister and the economic planners. By now, the budget policy that will be released this week we should have had that post We should have had that engagement. The private sector needs to be in that discussion. What we are seeing now and what continues to happen is the different interest groups will come to these different platforms, pull at each other. There is no consensus. There is no clear plan. The economic recovery program is a rejigging of the old and we are stuck in this rut. And so I think for me, we have got to deal with this at a serious high level. If the president politically can be dealt, met with, appeal to to say, let us have leadership on the side of economic planning, on the side of bringing all the state and the private sector. But also secondly, Nick, we have to agree that whatever has been done is inadequate. We cannot keep stringing the dead horse, it's dead. Let's throw it out, let's get new alternatives, and at least we can then talk instead of flogging, flogging a dead horse. That's my input in terms of what can be done immediately. And then you can start to craft proper priorities, programs, and then decide what needs to be done now as a medium term, and then later as a short, as a medium and a long-term intervention. But they're definitely, we're gonna sit now and listen to the budget speech. All of us will, you know, argue about it and so yeah. forth, but there's well, no coordination and there's no change. Yeah. So Thank you that's for that. So that's going down the trail that uh, Paddy was talking about, and, and I think many would agree with you. Let me ask uh, Abba Omar and then Tushan to comment, please. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Nick. Um, I think the question uh, that I'm going to try and focus on is the question that um, both Paddy and yourself were focusing on and Tabi Sang has been uh, addressing, and that is how do we take it forward? So I think uh, having been uh, associated with the Lulamiti scenarios and having looked at the evolution of the ADR as economic modeling, having looked at how Business for South Africa developed its response, having looked at what Labour's inputs were, having looked at what the Institute of Economic Justice were, the, you know, as you're saying, there's just no end to all the kind of processes that, that we can bring together. Um, and I think what Paddy is uh, highlighting is the sheer capacity or ability to pull this together. So I like the idea of, uh, you know, returning Constitutional Hill to what it was, make it, a, make it a prison again, and let's put all those representatives of labor and civil society and government and business in and lock away the key until we've got a plan. Because we just never seem to be able to bring those brains together and those analysts together and 
And last year, there was so much of hope around a lot of the inputs that went into what was eventually a very watered down version that's now referred to as the economic recovery and reconstruction program. So that's the one thing. The second thing, and Nick, you shouldn't get off lightly from this because just because you chaired in the session, your personal inputs will be very important as well. As to like, where do you see, it, I mean, is it possible to even get this kind of convening together, you know? Uh, as in Tabi Seng saying that Nedlex is not the adequate uh, place for that. Uh, you know, we've got the NCC, but NCC we have a problem with because there's like that division between uh, the securocrats and the more business oriented elements of, uh, and so, so wh where should we go? You know, we've got a problem with the Presidential Economic Advisory Council and there's the state owned enterprise council and, 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 and there's so many different sort of options that we've been, where does coordination come from? Now, are we going to move into a kind of just the situation of fluidity and, you know, depending on the moment someone takes an initiative or not? I think ultimately a lot depends on what happens around the presidency, yes, but then we know that there's all kinds of issues there. And when we're looking at economics, let's not close the eyes, to, let's not close our eyes to political reality as well. A hugely divided ANC, which is undermining the president every turn, and then is unable to do the kinds of things that it should be doing. So this is the reality. Where should we be aiming for coordination firstly, and then what's the best way to do that? Thank you. Thanks so much for that, Abba. Uh, Tushan. Um, <clears throat> uh, thank you very much, Nick. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I, I just want to express a few things. One is that I like your example of um, how you expressed in terms of we have the skills, we have the institutions, and I most importantly, I want to agree with many of the presenters in terms of the frameworks and the policies that we have all of those in place and it's evidence of, the, of such. But what I'm not hearing is that as part of the plan that, uh, uh, that is proposed, and yes, we need to have a lockdown session with the right parties involved in it, is that we're not talking about the life of a citizen. So if we look at say, why, we, why do we need to deliver and the moment we say, let's pick a target, a target is the citizen, right? Forget business for a second. We're not saying it's not important. Forget uh, uh, all the institutions that deliver to, to that. That's, uh, we're not saying that's not important. We're not saying let's forget about the thievery that's happening. We're not saying that's not important. What we're saying is that if you fix the citizen to give that citizen, for example, good health, a good path to education and don't lower the standards. Uh, a decent, you know, when we talk of the climatic conditions of um, the work, yes, we agree it's changed and it's changing, it's evolving. The big question is, I think somebody posed it earlier on was, um, are we ready? Are we ready to do business in the new uh, era, right? Uh, and, and I think if I hear what was coming across, the, the answer is relatively straight no because that is why we're suffering. And then when we start on the policies from the GDPs, why we're not making it to that of the high debt, to that of all the symptoms around that, we struggle tremendously. So I, I like the idea of getting, um, which we shouldn't take too long about it, is getting people to a room, getting the different sector segments into that to, to, to make sure that the target should be the citizens and everything. So once we have that as the, the target, we work backwards. So we say big business, small business, the institutions of delivery, whether it's government or private sector, whether it's the city councils or whether it's the institutions, whether it's the model that I think uh, Asga has raised in the various unpacking of stuff, that all would fall into place because then we say as individuals and as a collective team, we can deliver and what we're delivering towards and against. Uh, it was very nice that, you know, the reason is that big business, for example, they talk of the uh, oligopolis uh, uh, examples, you know, to prevent such is because there's no leadership and that we, know we don't have a target focus. So we're not saying there mustn't be uh, such. What we're saying is that, you know what, equal opportunity for everybody. On policy and on paper, there is such, 
because we're changing. But when we don't have that focus, so ultimately I would go as far as saying, if I was in charge, as an example, if I was the president, I would basically say, let's have a hundred year plan, but we review this plan every year, every five years, and we work with the times so that we achieve the plan. You know, the strategies will change, the goals might change, but it's how do we get to that particular goal of the citizen first. And if we put our citizens first, we're not, we're not excluding anybody. We know it's a, it's a global uh, village, right? We start off at home and then we grow home towards the neighbors and we've, we go on and on and on. So I just wanted to put that out there for food for thought. Thank you very much, very enlightening. Thank you very much for that. And you're absolutely right. That's what I saw on Sunday. People not living the lives they should, not even close to living the lives they should. So thank you for humanizing it. Uh, Siraj. Go ahead. Hi, thank you very much, Nick. Um, I've got uh, a few shortcomings rather than questions and I uh, contribute to the discussion. The first is that I really like the, the way in which um, the idea of pillars of different spheres of things or pillars of things need to be addressed. And, and all of these obviously um, interact with it. And, and I think it gives us a sense that they have things that um, we have done things as government successfully in the past and we can build on that and we can do more. Um, but it also shows a way in which those interventions will contribute towards a GDP growth. The second comment I want to make, and, and it's a link to the first about the, the pillars, because the important, for me, a really important part of the story and the pillar is macroeconomic policy and the need for expansionary macroeconomic policy. And notwithstanding arguments by some people that macro policy has been expansionary just because they've seen expenditure increase, I think we need to think about that more seriously. And the reason I say this is that we've seen within the mainstream, within orthodox macroeconomic thinking, since at least since the global financial crisis, but in the literature predating that, the late 90s and early 2000s, uh, an almost revolutionary change in the way in which mainstream econo economists, I'm not talking about post-Keynesian and Marxian and other kinds of economists, uh, heterodox economists, I'm talking about the mainstream. I'm talking about people like Jason Fuhrman, who was um, chief, uh, uh, the head of uh, President Obama's um, Council of Economic Advisors. I'm talking about people like Janet Yellen. I'm talking about Bernanke. You know, the, the, there was an attempt to use monetary policy after the global financial crisis and, and they realized that there were limits with that. And it made them question how fiscal policy should, should be used, how fiscal policy should be coordinated with monetary policy and the role of central banks. And also within that implicitly questioning the independence and how we define the independence of central banks. And not in a populist way, but thinking through what that means, not only with the crisis, but generally how you support growth. And, and one important thing that has come from the developed countries is that full employment has come back on the agenda. That was the main goal of macro policy in the post Second World War period until the late 70s. In the, what we call the neoliberal era, um, the, the main goal was, was inflation targeting and, uh, and, and, and basically keeping prices stable and limiting the role of government and saying that fiscal policy doesn't work. The, the revolutionary change in, in, in mainstream macro thinking, and it's drawn closer to a lot of heterodox and post-Keynesian thinking, is that you can use stimulatory fiscal policy without getting into debt problems. And then people will say, well, but South Africa is different to developed countries and other countries because our, um, we pay high interest rates and we have high debt levels. And, and if you actually examine the arguments used by these mainstream economists today, I mean, there, there's a quiz, uh, there's an issue that debt to GDP is a ratio. You have to understand the dynamics in, in what happens to debt with growth, with the changes in interest rates and what government and the central bank can do to limit the increase in interest rates versus the, the growth rates and how you support growth. And, and it doesn't matter if your, your growth rate is lower than your interest rate, over time you can make your debt more sustainable and as you grow your debt to GDP levels decline. And this creates 
a, a, a confidence in the economy, it creates a confidence in the balance sheets of the central bank. And, and so in South Africa, I, I feel that commentators from the financial sector, we've seen some in this meeting, the mainstream media, but unfortunately also national treasury and economic leaders in government, not actually considering that whole new literature, but also the, the, the policy actions taken to deal with COVID-19, but since the global financial crisis. So that's, that's, I think, my second comment. And I'm sorry I spent a bit longer on that, but I thought I needed to explain it. The last one is going to be very quick. I really find it problematic that people keep harping on about intergenerational equity when talking about debt in South Africa. The reason why government needs to take on more debt now is to, is to support and, 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 and stop, well, I should say, stop the, the, the unraveling of the, of the social fabric in society. You know, poor children are living in poverty. They're dying early. There's the, the, the infant mortality rate is high. The levels of stunting is high, stunting which affects whole generations over multi-generations. And so when we think about intergenerational equity and talking about debt in that context, I find it really problematic and scary. I mean, whose children are we talking about that we worried are going to inherit this debt? And so I would ask that, people be more sensitive and change the tone of that debate. And unfortunately, we're also seeing that coming from government. So I'm going to stop there. And thank you very much for the opportunity. And thank you very much for, for this um, presentation and giving ADRS and, and, and Gauteng government and others the space to do this presentation. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Neil, the uh, is it Neil? Yes, Neil's next. The floor is yours. Thanks, Nick, and everyone. Sorry, I'm going to keep my camera off because my uh, the quality of my um, uh, uh, line is not that great. Um, yeah, just to just to echo what others have said, I think these scenarios are extremely useful uh, in focusing our minds on uh, a whole lot of things. But one thing in general, which is that we need a complete shift in the way we think about the economy, that we, to, to, to remain stuck in a reactive mode where we're in a deep crisis, economic crisis, and we try to fiddle with, uh, you know, with, with, with various ratios and so on uh, in a short-term short manner just gets us deeper and deeper into problems. And I think what Asgar has shown is that, you know, if we take a more medium to long-term view, we can do counterintuitive things like increased spending, increased debt, uh, et cetera, in, in a productive way, in a coherent and a sensible way, which actually makes our economy more sustainable. So we need to get out of simplistic uh, notions about the relationship between these different indicators and think much more dynamically. And I think that's what the ADRS scenarios allow us to do. Just to come onto the question that you asked, Nick, about processes. You know, I, I would caution against making NEDLAC a, a whipping horse. You know, I've spent many years in NEDLAC and I'm probably one of, you know, I've suffered at the hands of NEDLAC many, many times and uh, I've had to sit through all sorts of problematic processes. But the pro problem is not NEDLAC. The problem is around the question of the political will in the different constituencies to give the necessary uh, seniority and attention to negotiations so that if you send junior uh, government officials, if you send junior business representatives and labor, the same applies, et cetera, you know, to negotiations which require sort of national urgency and priority, you can't expect NEDLAC magically to deliver. So, you know, what labor and business did, uh, you know, a number of years ago was to create their own forum called the Millennium Labor Council to try and get around this question of the juniorization of NEDLAC. Um, and they put very, very senior leaders and managed to crack a deal on various labor market issues. Some of you will remember, but and there was nothing magical about that. It had to go back to NEDLAC. Um, and it, it, it was a deal between business and labor, uh, which was then you know, navigated through, through, through the NEDLAC processes. So I just you know, would warn against you know, a simplistic, suggestion that um, you know, another forum is going to resolve the problems that NEDLAC hasn't been able to, to resolve. We have to, the presidency has to lead. You know, if we look at all major crises in, in recent history, you know, uh, whether it was around the, the you know, world wars, whether it was 
around the uh, the uh, depression uh, in the early 20th, 20th century, the globe, you know, the, the, the New Deal in, in America, et cetera. You know, the state, the president has had to lead. And they often have, have had to lead by trampling on the toes of powerful interests. If you look at what happened in East Asia, uh, big business did not like what, uh, what the state did. The same applies to, applied to Roosevelt and the New Deal. Um, Etc. So, you know, constituencies are going to have to be dragged, kicking and screaming. The question is, is there a shared sense of crisis? You know, you talk about the humanitarian uh, situation. Sir Raj was talking about it now. Do people really understand what it means that 70% of our uh, population is living in poverty? Do people really understand what the NITSCRAM survey means when it says that X percent of households ran out of money to buy food? Uh, in the last week. So there isn't that shared sense of crisis. And therefore, again, that has to be um, uh, elevated by, 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 by the president in particular. The other point which I raised in the chat is that we also shouldn't think of business as a monolith. Uh, you know, the, the, the manufacturing circle in South Africa deals with issues of the productive sector. And they, in the early 2000s, uh, supported a dec or crafted a joint declaration with Labour, in which they were calling for expansionary fiscal policies, for reducing the cost of credit, uh, for a much different approach to monetary policy, uh, to competition policy, et cetera, et cetera. That has never bitten because that sector is, is very junior within organized business. So yes, there are, there are different interests. And uh, so, uh, this is going to require a rethinking of, uh, if you like, the anatomy of uh, the sort of correlation of forces, if, or uh, you know, to use a, a high-flown phrase, within with, with, within within South Africa, and therefore requires that political leadership that every, everybody is talking about. Right? Thank you, Sir Raj. Sorry, thanks, Neil. Uh, my mic was off. Uh, Lutando and then Pelisa. Thanks, Nick. Um, I would like to also keep my camera off, please, because of uh, bandwidth challenges. Um, my name is Lutando Nogdenisa. I'm a senior researcher for the ANC uh, caucus in Parliament. I just want to ask the panels in terms of the, the panelists, in terms of the way forward. Don't you think that there is a role for parliament? Um, I'm just, I was just reading the constitution section 42.3, where it says the national assembly is elected amongst other things to provide a national forum for public consideration of issues. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So, don't you think maybe besides the executive, you know, head of state and so on, there's a role for parliament, maybe the speaker, or through the committees of parliament for a discussion on the scenarios? Just a question. Thank you. Sorry, my mic keeps going off for some reason. Pelisa. Uh, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Nick, and um, good afternoon, colleagues. Now, I mean, I just, I'm actually triggered by the point that um, Neil was actually making. I mean, I've been talking on the on the chat since the beginning, but I just want to make two points. Particularly on the issue around, you know, the shared sense of crisis. For instance, by now, I mean, given what we're going through, one of the key things that the Reserve Bank should have actually started doing is to look at the redefinition of NPLs, non-performing loans. Because fundamentally, it's so crucial around the issues of access to finance. And I think South Africa, as part of the G20, is the only developing country, well, I mean, well, as the only country from Africa, they should have been able to, to influence the Basel Committee. So I had the site of the G20 document, um, which is going to be discussed during the G20 meeting in Italy. I mean, it's just written in one liner that uh, we will consider the, you know, the, the MPLs 
as when the situation arises. Now, of course, if you do recognize that your balance sheet has shrunk, your private sector is actually in crisis. Therefore, you really need to start looking at NPL because it's linked to access to credit, but also in terms of the credit rating score. But also fundamentally, it's linked to supporting the manufacturing sector and the recovery sector. I mean, they, I mean for recovery. So I'm, I'm really concerned about that. And I think probably that's something that part of the conversation of, um, of the, with the leaders of this, uh, uh, um, of this discussion today should actually take to the president because it's, a, it's an important issue. I think the second issue really, it's also about looking at what type of uh, uh, microeconomic intervention. So Isaiah makes the point that actually the South African economy is really not geared or structured in a way that actually is meant for growth. And I think that's true. Now, I had happened to be part of the partnership uh, conversations when I was working at Gauteng as, a, as an economic advisor on partnership with sectors. But one of the key things, and that's why I was making a comment that the, the economic coordination between national government and provincial government is actually quite messy. I mean, with, with all the framework that exists, but when it comes to the economic coordination, there's really no clarity. And the work that Gauteng government had started could not move very far because it, it had, well, I mean, at that point, it was just conversation. But I think the point I just want to make is that if private sector is willing to come into the party, as I'm hearing uh, now, is that amongst the key issues, we really need to look at structural transformation at a sectoral level. So let me make just a simple example, for instance. If you look at the steel industry currently, currently we have one a, 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 a company that dominates the sector, which is Metal, right? So it is, it's a primary producer. And then you have those who are actually linked with, with, the, with, the, with, the, um, with the sector. But interestingly, the products get imported, get exported because we actually worried about export revenue. Now, the key question is that we really need to start thinking about why would the medical sector or dental sector import all, almost 80% of their products, right? from primary product that has been manufactured itself. And I know it's a conversation we've been having for a long time, but I think the private sector needs to really show a, a, a leadership in that area. I understand that one of the key things this process has also delayed was due to the fact that they never wanted to actually take risk and provide leadership. But I think the last point I want to make, I think I see some of the scenarios that um, I ask as, contain, as I mean, are contained in this report, I do think that we really need to think about provincial government and local government when as far as, and I understand and I accept the point that he makes that we could ring, ring friends certain intervention at a macroeconomic level. But also we must also think about a bottom up driven a, a economic development. I mean, cooperative, cooperative sector is completely left outside. It actually does not even get a penny in terms of support, let alone access to, uh, to markets. So I do think that it's a, it's, a, it's a group that we really need to consider instead of sometimes the established businesses. But I think for these uh, scenarios, and I think even if they are simplifies as they are, we're going to really require a fairly matured leadership, both from terms of the public sector and the private sector, and I suppose with civil society organization that is committed to the process, but also willing to sacrifice because we're not gonna be able to find any common ground with that. And if both groups, which we've seen is that currently our economic policy discourse is dominated by powerful and uh, powerful groups. So if you're powerful, you dominate the discourse and in terms of what's uh, in terms of the cost or economic cost of a uh, South African trajectory. But if you're not powerful, you have no voice. And I do think that this time around, if there's a recognition across that this we're, we're facing a humanitarian crisis, which already as women from a gender based violence perspective, uh, we actually experiencing because we're experiencing social instability. So it's a huge issue. So I do think that that's really something that we need to present to the table to the president. And I would really support that we take forward some of the deliberations here. Thank you, uh, Prof. Thank you, Polisa. Uh, Noabisa. Uh, please allow me to um, keep my um, video off as well. I'm having um, a bit of a slow internet. Um, so my question has to do with regard to how um, we begin to democratize the process of economic policy making. Um, right now, especially from um, my perspective as, a, as an outsider looking in, uh, I haven't really um, participated in forums like, for example, NetLag, etc. But from, from my perspective, it does definitely seem as though um, 
um, the decision making um, with regard to uh, policy, economic policy, that the the trajectory and even the the, the policy instruments that that South Africa uses is the purview of a, a very small um, sector, not only just of society but also even of government. And there seems to be a growing consensus um, in South African society that, look, we need um, to do things differently. We need to explore new avenues because what we have been doing so far is not working. However, um, there is very little shift um, or, or responsiveness um, in these key um, government institutions, like, for example, Treasury, like, for example, uh, um, the Reserve Bank, etc., to even be open to exploring these alternatives. So my my kind of question, um, especially for those who, who are privy to the processes behind these these um, um, mechanisms of decision making, is are, are there um, um, mechanisms to open processes of decision making up to more public scrutiny, transparency, accountability, and um, allowing ordinary South Africans to actually influence um, the trajectory that economic policy making um, is able to take. Thank you for that. Uh, Robbie. It's a, it's a very interesting question. I'm not sure we'll get to it fully today, but I'm noticing some of the reforms that are coming along that are structural, Party Funding Act, electoral reforms being proposed. It, it, we need to open up this democracy to make it work because there is so much lack of accountability at all levels, across all sectors. And so it's a very important point. All right, I'm going to see if there's anybody else that's uh, got their hand up. I don't see anybody. So I'm going to start closing up. I'm going to give, if it's okay, uh, Paddy the last, uh, just a minute, and ask her also a minute before I hand over to Soma Dikeni just to give us one or two of his thoughts. So if anyone wants to make a last minute, Charmaine, I see you're up. Please go ahead, Charmaine, and then I'm going to start closing up. Hi, Nick. Thanks for the opportunity. I've been listening to all of you. Um, very insightful, meaningful contribution at every level. And I think now, what, now we, the, the earlier speaker made some valid points. Um, I hear that we need to wait for the president. And my question is, if we wait for him, we're running out of time, right? And we've been waiting for far too long. So the fact that we're all here and there's willingness for us to actually drive this forward, what can we do to just target one thing, whatever it is, to be able to mobilize this change? Because there's a crisis, people are suffering, everybody mentioned it. The unemployment rate is going up. Production needs to happen here, but we're importing. There's so many things that we need to actually do. And if we continue to wait, I hear we need to wait for government to take the stand and all of that, but it's been, ugh, time is of essence, we cannot wait. So I'd like, the intent, the reason I'm sitting in this meeting is to go, what's the one thing? The fact that we hear there's willingness, the fact that the deputy minister did not come is indicative of, is there desire? Because we can have all the institutions, if there is no desire, we're not gonna get the outcome that we actually want. So that's my point, the scenarios are amazing. Um, I'm grateful for everybody that have applied their mind and shared their contribution, but what is it that we can do? to make that one change. Even if it's a small one, you can just get the momentum going. So thank you for the opportunity and your time. Thank you so much, Charmaine. I mean, I was struck right at the beginning by caliber of people in this conversation and I've, you, you've sustained that. What's the one thing? Good question. All right, let's uh, wrap up now. Um, I always end Zoom, Zoom calls on time. So I'm gonna give uh, Dr. Lohla uh, uh, the word and then Askar and then hand over to uh, Dr. Fakeni. Pali, would you like to uh, say? Oh, I see lots I of hands see. coming up now. Just hold, on hand of... I can just hold on one second. Desmond, uh, I'm going to give you, and I'm not sure if it's President McClunty or someone from the foundation, just quickly a minute, I will finish us on time. So but if you just hold for a second, uh, go ahead. Um, I'm not sure who it is, one of the, to someone at the Kalema Moklante Foundation, or maybe it is uh, President Moklante himself. Go ahead. That, thank you. Thank you, Nick. Uh, I, 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 I was muted. My, 
I, I think uh, we, we need to thank Asda and uh, uh, Badi for this wonderful presentation. And <clears throat> of course, all the uh, invaluable inputs from uh, fellow participants. I think one of the critical uh, matters that we have to bring to the fore is that we need the right to win the right to define what we see as our strategic goal as South Africans. Uh, I'm saying this because uh, if, if you look at, uh, I mean, to, to this week we'll be listening to the budget uh, presentation and, and, and the, the reality is that the budget uh, policy statements are negotiated with the World Bank and the IMF uh, with the help of rating agencies. Uh, how does that speak to what we define as our strategic goal as South Africans? And, and, and leadership consensus is as important as policy consistency. Uh, if we are to move away from the, the shortcomings of short-termism, because our experience is that uh, uh, every new administration, even uh, you know, from the same uh, governing party, uh, takes us back to square one uh, in terms of uh, policy. So if we are to have uh, uh, you know, long-term plan, which we break down to uh, five-year uh, programs of action. Uh, how, how are we going to ensure that uh, it, it, it's not revised by uh, every new administration that comes uh, into office? Uh, these are questions that uh, torture me all the time because I've, I've seen at very close range how in, in, in the one breath we speak uh, in terms of the National Development Plan, we speak of a, uh, the need to create a capable state. And, and yet in our actions, we actively uh, undermine uh, the, the, the state because uh, the, the appointment of senior managers is left to ministers and each minister uh, wants to bring from day one uh, their own senior managers uh, and, and to push out those who uh, were, were, were appointed by their predecessors. And, 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 and this is uh, one of the <clears throat> debilitating uh, uh, practices, which unless we find a solution uh, to, to how to create uh, a, a capable state and, and to balance uh, the, the uh, various interests of key stakeholders in society, structures such as uh, NetLeg will, will forever uh, be undermined uh, by, by the competing interests. And <clears throat> you see the, the issues of uh, defining our strategic goal and, and setting out to uh, implement that strategic goal speak to what it means to be a citizen. Because uh, for, to, to many of uh, the broadest cross-section of South Africans uh, today, the, the, the bargain of being a citizen uh, is experienced only through uh, disappointment, deep disappointment, failure, and the brute force of, of the state. Uh, and, and so it gives rise to the a notion of politics being a, a bad for, 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 for our economy, bad for our uh, society. So the, the 
the politics of anti-politics take root uh, and, 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 and uh, Dr. Paddy Lehotla spoke of uh, the need to have a mobilizing uh, uh, goal that you know would be able to uh, find resonance across uh, society. Uh, yeah, I thought I should raise these issues, uh, uh, Nick, because they torture me uh, all the time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for doing that. Uh, Pali, uh, a minute from you, and then a minute from Askar, and then I'm going to hand over to Somadon. Uh, Nick, uh, thank you very much. I, I, I really, mine is to uh, say that uh, thank you very much for the inputs and uh, probably the path that uh, we have uh, said perhaps we should uh, follow, uh, which it must summit by convening uh, with the president, uh, because uh, legitimacy is very important, uh, but uh, mobilizing society, what is socially desirable, is in the responsibility of ourselves. And uh, I, I think uh, the, the, the president, President Trump has actually stated it <laughs> and through the, the foundation, uh, the, the, the seminar of uh, Summit of Equals uh, has started that process. And I think social expressing that social desirability, supporting it with the technocracy that we have and the inputs we are making is not leaving it to the president. Uh, what we are only saying is president, we are expressing our views on this matter and we are taking matters in our hands. And we are helping you to define that which is different. And we can take our inputs to lead and define that what is different. Mm. I don't think we have summited with that kind of courage. Mm. The time is now to say, this is socially desirable. It is politically mobilizing and it is economically feasible. What we have put before us as a nation is not socially desirable. It is not politically mobilizing although it might be in terms of pure finances feasible because it can be afforded. 3% you can afford. And uh, you will deliver bad results. And uh, that's the outcome of uh, what you have chosen. A politically, uh, not mobilizing politically, not desirable socially, affordable financially with very bad outcomes for the nation. What we are saying is here is a socially desirable policy a politically mobilizing action and uh, an economically feasible solution mm. that will put South Africa forward. That's what we need. And Lovely. we as ourselves as mm. defining that what is socially desirable. Thank you for sharing that. Thank Oscar, last comment from you. Is he asleep? Are you still there? Asga. Okay. okay, I'm sorry, I was oh, there okay. <laughs> we, It's two, I, in, I, two I, in the morning, I, Asghar. Uh, <laughs> it's three o'clock in time. the morning, yes, please. <laughs> well, uh, well, I just want to thank everyone for enriching this, uh, this meeting. Uh, and and, and uh, I took a lot of notes and uh, we, you know, I really appreciate uh, your time. And, and, and we'll send you the, uh, the final copy of the reports uh, today, tomorrow, you know. Uh, uh, so thank you very much. I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, for, thanks for your inputs. And it's a great model for us to consider. Right, Dr. Fikeni, the floor is yours. Welcome to you. Well, uh, thank you very much, colleagues, on such an exciting engagement the whole morning. Let me preface my uh, one or two comments with uh, expressing our thanks to Nick for steering this ship so very well the whole morning. Uh, so Nick, for being a program director, we thank you. Okay. And also extend our thanks to the main presenters, uh, Aska and uh, Paddy, knowing that Aska had to wake up in the middle of the night uh, in order to help us uh, grapple with this particular challenge. And uh, the discussions 
uh, in the form of Dr. Ntabiseng, uh, Maleko, as well as Azayam Tanga. Your insights are really appreciated. The participants, uh, so many of the people I've been looking at here, including our former president, uh, Halima Motlante, who remain very active and inspiring in many ways on our public discourse. Um, I've seen a number of economists, a number of media people, a number of opinion makers in the society, which means we can carry this particular, uh, you know, discourse forward. I just want to say, when we started, of course, let me thank our partners, the Indulamiti South Africa Scenarios 2030, AD, ADRS, as well as the Gordon Institute of Business Science of the University of Pretoria for organizing this event together. I just want to start by saying when these scenarios were crafted, we promised that we were going to provide a platform for strategic con conversation about the future so that we take the nation away from its obsession with headlines and sensation of everyday things which produce more heat than light. And I do think that this economic modeling exercise which center the economy and these policy pillars at the very heart of this discussion is an effort again to say our future is very important for us to reflect on what is happening now and begin to say, how do we change it? I do know that many people have been saying um, who should be convening who will lead this? Where will government be? And I ask myself, what if political leadership is so consumed by the current political tragic comedy and theater? Do we wait for them until they arise from that space? Or should we not be mobilizing? I want to say we are the leaders we've been waiting for. Each time in South Africa where people rose up and participated in the mass defiance campaigns of the 1950s, they were able to produce a freedom charter. When people from different sectors came up, mobilized as part of the mass democratic movement and other formations in the 80s, they were able to produce a negotiated political settlement and rendered the apartheid system dysfunctional, but each time we have left that function to just a few leaders, particularly political leaders, things have not gone as well as it should be. Of course, the private sector leaders as well have a responsibility. In the 80s, it was the Africana business community that was able to fly and meet political leaders and exercise influence. Where are those business leaders today to say, we want to raise our hand? This is a burning platform. The civic organizations, the churches, the scholars, everybody mobilized. And we had that creative energy, but today the source of our failure is to abdicate from that responsibility and look externally for people who will solve these problems. That is our biggest dilemma today. We are looking left, we're looking right, we're looking east, we're looking west for solutions. And we aren't saying maybe we are the leaders we've been waiting for. And I want to end by saying the crisis we face might be the best thing that has happened to us. When you have a mild headache, you live on Grandpa and Panado. But when you have a migraine headache, that's when you submit yourself for real examination and serious surgery or operation. 
a crisis is not a crisis until we fail to see opportunities to overhaul the systems. It was the Great Depression for America which produced some of the greatest reforms. It was the Civil War under Lincoln that produced some of the greatest reforms. It was the Korean Peninsula War that allowed South Korea to overhaul its systems. It was the genocide in Rwanda. The crisis become a crisis when we do not identify those opportunities. And I close by saying, if not you, who will do it? If not now, when will it be done? If not here, where will it be done? I thank you. Thank you so much. That's a very inspiring uh, set of words, Samadola. Thank you. I think we'll all, all take that to heart. The reason we got together is we are ready for this moment. I've always thought, when is a problem ready to be solved? It's about time this problem is ready to be solved by all of us. So thank you, everybody, all the institutions, all the participations. I, I want to end it by asking what we have in common and whether we know we need each other. I think we're in that zone. So let's take advantage of it. And let's, as you say, let's not have a, a generation that follows us that asks what were they thinking. All right, everybody, I'm going to wrap it up. Thank you once again. Enjoy the rest of your day. Let's all get back to productive work, and uh, I hope we'll see you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.